Bon, je vous propose de commencer notre, euh, notre matinée qui est à... So, I suggest we begin our morning session. We have a lot to do. So, Mr. Mato, um, let's begin. So, we have a hearing which we've called State of Play of Implementation of the Common Fishery Policies and Future Outlook. So there's a, an, an initiative report, which is actually an implementation report about the Common Fisheries Policy. Gabriel Mato is the rapporteur, and the European Commission has planned to have a report on implementation of the common fishery policy from now to end 2022. So we felt it would be a good idea to have our own opinion. <clears throat> and when I say our own opinion, that's the opinion of Parliament. So today we have before us eight experts who have been kind enough to come before us so that we can have an overview of this common fisheries policy. So we have work on the presentation by Gabriel Mato, but today the idea is to have an exchange with experts. So we have a three hour hearing planned. So what I suggest is that since we've kind of, we're not used to having three hours in a row anymore, so let's have a short break around 10.30 to just cut our hearing in half because three hours without stopping seems a bit much. So we'll have a short break. And the speakers and colleagues, just be aware that we will have that break. So the first part, I see documents of all sorts. So the first part that I have the pleasure of opening is objectives and management tools for fisheries. Where do we stay and how to where to navigate towards in the future years. So we will hear the first four speakers first. Before I open the debate, I would indicate to the four experts to please stick to your time that you've been allocated. You have 10 minutes each for your presentation, and I will shamelessly cut you off if you exceed the 10 minutes. So maybe one minute, but otherwise we won't have enough time for questions. So for the first part, we have Mr. Javier Garret, Mr. Esven Sverdrub Jensen, Mrs. Vera Coelho, and Clara Ulrich, who will be making a presentation. So I will allow them to introduce themselves. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Javier Garat. President of Europesh. Welcome, sir. Mr. Garat, you have the floor. Thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here in this important hearing. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I hope that uh, the technicians uh, put it in place. Can we see it? We can see the presentation. I don't oh, know okay. if you can see it, but okay. we can I cannot, see it. I cannot, hear, I cannot see it here, but it's okay. Well, the first, the first message I would like to, to send you is management is the best tool for conservation. And that's something for us very clear. Wait, wait uh, just uh, 10 seconds. To, yeah. We are fixing the question of the presentation. I hope you can see the presentation now. I can see it now, yes. Thank okay, you very much. that's okay. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Yes, as I was saying, management is the best tool for conservation. That's the main message I would like to send you today. And uh, because good management, we have seen how in the common fisheries policy, we also have some good successes in the Atlantic. Uh, we have repeated this all over the time, 50% 50 50 reduction in fishing pressure in, in just 20 years. We have uh, in 10 years, more than 50% of abundance uh, of fish stocks in the Atlantic. We went from five tax set in line with MSY in 2009 to a total of 62 in 2020. And as the European Commission repeats continually, continuously, 90%, 99% of our landings um, from EU uh, managed stocks are sustainable fish. And uh, we have contributed to the Green Deal and uh, the, the, the fish to farm with 48% uh, reductions of uh, GHG compared to 90 levels. We have adopted safety and social standards uh, with the directive implementing Convention 188. And as we always say, we are talking about the best, the, the 
per the perfect protein, the best option in terms of food security and fight against climate change. Please, the next slide. And, and this huge improvement is in, in fish populations has only been made possible by a strong reduction in fishing capacity. According to the staff, the European Union fleet numbered around 74,000 vessels in 2019. And this means that more than 25,000 fishing vessels are gone in the European Union in the last 12 years. Next slide, please. Less vessels means less people working for the sector. Year after year, there is a reduction in terms of employment. Another challenge in, in need of addressing is the attractiveness of working in the sector. The generation, generational change is an endemic problem. The latest data indicates that uh, the European Union fishing fleet has an average age of 30 years. That was in 2019. Not only the old age of the European Union fleet will pose an issue in the near future, also the fact that the largest proportion of the workforce, 58%, is between 40 and 60 years old. So young fishermen will not be attracted unless good prospects for the future, better protection and optimal working condition across the sector are offered. Please, next slide. The common fisheries policy dictates the need to achieve MSY levels for all fish stocks. But at what cost? That's my question. Great progress has been made so far, but science clearly indicates that having all stocks at MSY levels is an unrealistic expectation that could only be achieved through significant reduced yields. Is it what we want? Reduce less food, in our opinion? The European Union cannot afford to offer less supply of fish to its home market, resulting in an ever-increasing self-sufficiency gap for seafood. With the UK gone, already more than 70% of European Union seafood consumption is imported from non-European Union countries. In this regard, the sector has always advocated to fish the main target stocks at MSY levels, while monitoring the positive evolution of the bycatch stocks. This approach has led to the recovery and responsible fishing of many important fish stocks in the European Union. Furthermore, the introduction of new management tools, such as BMSY or maximum economic yield, as some of very as requesting, will be inoperative for fisheries management and another blow to the sector. FMSY is already difficult to achieve and maintain. Next slide, please. The sector was a promise that uh, the introduction of MSY policy will drive the recovery of stocks, translating to larger quotas and the production of more seafood and more jobs. That all the sacrifices in the short term will be paid off in the medium term and that all the problems will go away. The reality is that even though we have the majority of fish stocks in the Atlantic at MSY levels, as we saw in the previous slide, we are still losing jobs in the sector. Next slide, please. And if we look at quotas, effort reductions are not translated into higher seafood production. Also, some fluctuation exists. Statistical data show that the total production of seafood in the European Union has stagnated or even reduced over the last 20 years. Therefore, it seems that the eternal promise that MSY will double up fish population and jobs at sea was just that, a promise. It is clear that the European Union should not be obsessed with the MSY policy. Next slide. And then under the current, next slide, please. Under the current, uh, and, no, no, the previous. Uh, let's talk about capacity first. Under the current common fisheries policy, the space on board designed to the kitchen, cabins, Toilets and recreational areas are considered as part of fishing capacity. Obviously, these areas have nothing to do with the ability of the vessels to find, catch or store fish and therefore should not be counted as, as fishing capacity. The inadequate definition of fishing capacity in the common fisheries policy hinders in general the modernization of the fleet and in particular social and safety improvement. Therefore, we need to find alternative formulas for measuring fishing capacity, for instance, it could be used net tonnage instead of gross tonnage, or existing systems, systems in Norway or, or Iceland, which exclude 
areas set aside for relaxation, comfort, leisure, and working space from the calculation based on factors such as allocated quota or size of vessels. Next slide. And now we talk about landing obligation. Landing obligation proved one more time how some rules fabricated, fabricated in Brussels have little to do with the reality and are impossible to implement in practice. As recognized in Gaddis report, full and strict compliance with the landing obligation, especially in mixed fisheries, will mean closing the relevant fishery. As we can observe in the table produced by a parliament study on the, in, on only in the Celtic Sea, our fishermen face high risk of shocking the fishery. Next slide. So the sector has encountered endless problems when trying to implement the landing obligation that you can see in the left side. Despite having participated in many projects to improve selectivity and operationalize the landing obligation, the sector has been criticized for not fully implementing uh, a failed policy. In order to make it operational, the European Union had to adopt a patchwork of rules such as discard plans, uh, multi-annual plans, tax exemptions, etc., which rendered management and control extremely difficult. Europesh shares the objective to continue reducing discards as much as possible in Europe, but the landing obligation as established in the Common Fisheries Policy is not the way forward. The mixed fishery situation was completely overlooked when the unworkable landing obligation was designed. Discards are a part of mixed fisheries. A strong focus on selectivity is needed, of course, but a zero discard situation in mixed fishery is unrealistic. Fishermen are blamed for not achieving a situation which, per definition, is unachievable. We cannot stress enough that in its present form, the landing obligation does not work, cannot be complied with, and cannot be enforced. All this, despite the unrealistic efforts to make it workable through infringement procedures against member states and making everybody believe that the CCTV will sort out all the problems. It is a joint obligation of Council and the European Parliament to recognize a huge mistake made in 2012 and join forces in finding a better solution which is available. That is why we advocate for a revision of the landing obligation, Article 15. Next slide, please. The technical measure regulation is a newborn comprehensive uh, law. It was extremely difficult dossier, only adopted uh, after several attempts. According to the Commission, the regulation is fit for purpose. Also, of course, uh, it, can be, it can be improved in its implementation. But uh, as part of, of uh, nevertheless this, the newly commissioned decided to break away from this and create something new, totally disconnected from the, the fisheries reality and the common fisheries policy. We're talking about the action plan that uh, they want to put in place uh, that uh, uh, it's not waiting for the report of the functioning of the common fisheries policy. And uh, as part of the fabricated objectives, the Commission plans to phase out bottom contacting gears, particularly bottom, bottom trolling. The Commission neglects the importance of these fisheries and it is using cherry picking science. The Commission will put an end to sustainable and certified fisheries. And our question is, which will the Commission ban active bottom gears in the European Union while still accepting large scale imports from non European bottom trolling fisheries? Our plea is to keep developing a robust ecosystem based approach to fisheries management based on, on true science rather than seeking to ban bottom trolling based on enforced law. Next slide, please. So if we, keep, if we keep adopting an applicable legislation and new radical environmental policies under the Green Deal, I'm sure there will be plenty of fish in the sea, but no fishermen to catch it. So we are suffering a severe loss of fishing grounds caused by industrialization of marine space. Please go, go with, the, with the slides. Offshore wind farms, cables, sand gravel Can you come to a conclusion, please? Yes, I'm finishing. I'm finishing, yes. Oil and gas, MPAs, continue, continue with the slides. And, and, and NPAs with fishing bans, due to a very weak legal position on fisheries compared to all these users, which get exclusive rights without compensating fisheries uh, for losses. Phyllis, next one. And this will be the last one. No, the, the previous one. The previous one. 
Uh, and then the last point, uh, uh, please recognize something that is forgotten, the, the joint ventures in third countries. Uh, in, it's important to be recognized in the common fisheries policy. The European Union investment generates European Union GDP and employment. It's an important source of supply to the European Union market and consumers. It's the best tool I know for development cooperation in third countries, mainly in Africa and Latin America. We have the same health and sanitary standards that the European Union companies comply with respect international conventions, and the vessels are built, are built here in the, in the European Union, in the shipyard. So please recognize it and, and keep it in the common fisheries policy. The last, uh, the last uh, slide is just thank a summary. I will, not, I will not go further on it. Thank you very much. We have the presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup. Je vais passer uh, la parole. À... Thank you very much. The floor goes to the next speaker, Mr. Sven. Verjo Jensen is president of the European Association of Fish Producer Organizations, and this is why it's need it's necessary to give the floor to people from a variety of sectors. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you for this opportunity for EAPO to uh, to speak at, uh, at this hearing. I have a set of slides that I'm uh, hoping we can uh, we can see. Uh, next we can slide, see them. Uh, yes. Perfect. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just very briefly, EAPO uh, is uh, representing, uh, represents the producers' organization across Europe in nine different member states, 27 POs. We have uh, more than, uh, than 10,000 vessels that we represent, from the smallest vessels in the European fleet to some of the largest uh, vessels. Uh, so all across the board, uh, we, have, uh, we have members. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to say that, that from EAPO's point of view, we agree with with the, the presentation and the messages from uh, from Europesh. I think it was a very good presentation, so congratulations on that, uh, Javier. Um, I want to start maybe taking us outside of the EU and to one of our neighboring countries, uh, Norway, uh, big uh, fishing uh, country in itself. They have a little bit of a different approach to fisheries legislation in Norway. So when you open up the, the Norwegian law on, on fisheries, the first sentence is, that fisheries is not allowed. And then they spend the next hundreds of paragraphs and articles explaining how they will allow fisheries, how you can, uh, how you can uh, catch fish, how you can do it in a sustainable way. In the EU, we have a different approach. I like the first line of, uh, of the legislation. It says that fisheries is allowed, that fisheries is sustainable. It's a benefit to uh, to the European Union, to people, it's a healthy uh, way of, uh, of feeding uh, the world, and so on. But then we start with paragraphs and articles on how to limit fisheries, how to make it more difficult, how to, uh, how to control, and so on. And of course these management measures are needed, but the approach is that we're limiting fishing operations so far. Uh, on and on, and that's the core issue with the, with the CFP and why we as EAPO are very much for a revision of the, of the common fisheries policy. Because what fishermen really need from the CFP and from management tools is predictability, sustainability and profitability. Those are the three pillars that, that you need as a fisherman to build your business, to conduct your business, to look into the future, to invest in a greener and more uh, sustainable way of production, to pave the way for the next generation. As Javier said uh, early on, the, the average age of fishermen today is, is fairly old. And uh, in order to pave the way for a new generation, we need modern vessels, we need a perspective in life, something to look into. And right now, that's very difficult to, uh, to see with the current way that we approach regulation uh, in, in the EU. We need transparent rules that can be understood and that can be followed. If you look into the details of Article 15 and the technical measures, the control regulations, etc., there's an endless list of rules and regulations that cannot be understood and that cannot be followed. For example, on a pelagic vessel, you're not allowed to sort the fish you land, you catch. Everything has to be landed in bulk. That's really hard to understand for a fisherman, that he cannot, isn't allowed to increase the value of his catches by sorting it on board and delivering it to the particular processing uh, facilities. 
That's just one example. It's very difficult for a fisherman to understand why he's not allowed to discard uh, live fish from his vessel, why he's forced to bring in undersized fish to ports but cannot sell it. And the list goes on and on. Why are fishermen not allowed to use selective gear when they've developed it? But it cannot be put in place in the current legal framework. That's why we need to look a little bit to a different approach to, uh, to legislation, like the one in Norway, where we're looking at ways of making fisheries possible, easy, sustainable, and profitable. And just like Javier said earlier on, it seems like fisheries policy and the CFP is at the bottom of the legislative hierarchy. We need to bring the CFP on top in order to allow fishing operations to continue in a sustainable way. When we close an area for fisheries, we don't close the fishery, we move it to another area where other fishermen are conducting their fisheries. It's not without costs that we limit the, uh, the area of, uh, of operation for fishermen. There are knock-on effects all through the system. We need to put those things into perspective to analyze the consequences of legislation when it comes to environment, when it comes to offshore wind, all of these issues that were mentioned in the previous presentation, and put fisheries on top to allow fishermen to operate and to secure the predictability and the profitability of the fleet. Next slide, please. I think that the work that, that uh, Mr. Mato has done so far on the report is, uh, is well done, and, uh, and the, the questionnaire that was sent out to, uh, to everyone in the fishing community uh, and everybody who cares about, uh, about fisheries and the marine environment is, uh, is really a valuable tool for us when we reflect on the success and the lack of success when it comes to the CFP. So I'm using some of the questions from that questionnaire just to guide this, this presentation. When we speak about maximum sustainable yield, I think that we all agree that that would, is a wonderful target. But it's extremely difficult to reach it for all stock at the same time. And we also have to recognize that there are limits to the, what science is able to do, how well we can predict the development of fish stocks. That's what we've seen so far in the CFP. I think generally we've been successful in managing fish stocks sustainably in the EU, but we've also seen incredible fluctuations in quotas uh, from one year to another. In the Baltic, stocks have collapsed within two or three years, according to science. Cod in the North Sea, up and down. Mackerel, herring, up and down. That's not the kind of predictability that we're looking for as a fleet and that w what we should expect from the scientific community, really. So I think that part of a reform or a revision of the CFP is to look closely into the way that science is done and how we work with science and what we can expect from science. When we listen to ISIS, they are very clear on the limitations of their abilities into predicting the development of fish stocks. But the requests coming from the UN Commission, uh, coastal states, is way too ambitious in terms of what science can actually deliver. So there's a discrepancy between what is possible in terms of science and what is and the questions asked, and the deliverables asked. I've already mentioned Article 15. Is it fit for, fit for purpose? In the mixed fisheries, as Javier said, it's impossible. If we're looking at the effects of climate change, um, are we really, do we believe that, that the current CFP can, can, can work for us for another 10 years? Is it resilient when it comes to climate change, when it comes to the changes in the, the environment, when it comes to the effects of Brexit on quotas, etc.? I think it's a very dangerous path if we just allow ourselves just to do a report on the CFP and then move on for another 10 years with the current legislation in place. It would put us in an extremely difficult situation in another 10 years' time when we've seen the real effects of, of climate change what we've, and we've seen the real effects of choke species. I'm afraid of that, that what Javier said, that there will be plenty of fish, but no fishermen around. It's a real scenario uh, if we don't uh, act uh, now. When it comes to the socioeconomic science, it's part of the CFP, but we've never seen it implemented anywhere. 
we never analyzed the socioeconomic effects of massive changes in the TACs. We just implement the scientific advice, which is limited, as I just spoke. So I think that there's a, we believe there's a need for a much, much stronger emphasis on socioeconomic effects of policy decisions. That's something that's uh, lacking in, in the current system and needs to be looked at. Let's move on to the last slide. So just to point it out and echo what has already been communicated from, from, um, from Europe's side. The current CFP has all the tools to deliver on, on, uh, on sustainable fisheries management when you look at the headlines. But when it comes down to the details, it's not fit for purpose. It's simply impossible to fish, especially in the mixed fisheries, under the current legislation. One of the main mistakes of the current CFP is that we've introduced the CFP primarily, and then, but we forgot to change the control regulation, the technical measures, and all of those supporting pieces of legislation, capacity legislation, as uh, Xavier mentioned. That hasn't been done. So the CFP and the headlines all look wonderful, but when we look at the details of the CFP and the, let's say, the day-to-day -day legislation that fishermen deal with, it doesn't fit the policy. So the message from us is that we need a reform or revision of the CFP that is very clear. We cannot afford not to. There will be no green transition. There will be very, very few fishermen uh, alive uh, in 10 years' time if we allow the current legislation to uh, continue as it is. And I think just as a final message, when we look at healthy uh, management systems, right now we have a piece of legislation, the CFP, and a jungle of, uh, of derogations to allow it to work. That is not a healthy uh, way of managing uh, fish stocks or anything else. That should be proof in itself that, uh, that the fact that member state, states and the parliament have insisted on introducing so many derogations from the legislation is a clear sign that it's an unhealthy piece of legislation that it needs to be revised and it needs to be refined. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and for your messages. Thank you. Nous allons passer ma... We will now uh, move on to the representative of the NGO Oceana Europe, Mrs. Vera Coelho. And I do apologize if I haven't uh, pronounced your name properly, but you're the senior director for Oceania Europe. Thank you very much, Chair, MEPs, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this event today. Now, I'll be making my presentation today in English. I think the presentation is already available to you. Here you go. In English. Next slide, please. Before going specifically into the details of the CFP's objectives and tools, I would like to take a step back and recall the ambition of the CFP reform. Before the reform, overfishing was rampant. Fleet profitability was very low. And the resilience of the sector to external shocks was also extremely low. Next slide, please. So against this background, the CFP reform was presented as a root and branch reform aimed at overhauling the policy in order to rebuild fisheries abundance as the necessary condition for a profitable fishing sector and resilient coastal communities. And this fundamental change in approach had huge public support and indeed it was the European Parliament who ensured that citizens were heard that an ecosystem-based approach was put at the heart of the new policy and that the ambition to rebuild fish populations was written into the law as a key objective. Next slide, please. 
As a result, the current CFP recognizes that a healthy marine environment is not merely a pillar of sustainability that can be balanced against socio-economic considerations. Environmental sustainability, and in particular healthy and abundant fish stocks, are the necessary basis upon which socio-economic sustainability relies. And as such, restoring fish populations is the key to robust and profitable fishing sector in the long term. And in order to rebuild stocks above biomass levels capable of producing maximum sustainable yield, the CFP set a legally binding deadline to end overfishing for all stocks. It also recognized that fishing has a number of wider impacts on marine ecosystems, including bycatch of commercial as well as, as of sensitive species, and it tried to address the political nature of setting fishing limits and also the need for long-term, ecosystem-based, region-specific fisheries management through multi-annual plans. Next slide, please. So this was the high ambition that resulted from the reform at the end of 2013. Now, more than eight years later, what has the CFP achieved? It's clear that the legally binding requirement to end overfishing with an initial deadline of 2015 and an ultimate deadline of 2020 consistent with the deadlines under the United Nations was crucial in driving a reduction in overfishing in the Northeast Atlantic. Indeed, we see that most stocks with MSY assessments now have fishing limits in line with MSY advice. In the Mediterranean, however, where fisheries are managed through effort restrictions, we do not see much change and the majority of assessed stocks continues to be overfished. We also know that this decrease in overfishing has led to an increase in biomass, but the European Commission does not ask ISIS to provide BMSY estimates. So, in fact, we do not know how near or how far we are from the objective to restore all stocks above BMSY. Next slide, please. But the increase in biomass is one of the main factors that led to the increase in the average profitability of the fleet since the reform, with gross and net profits hitting record levels just before the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And again, contrast this with the situation before the reform, when on average the fleet was only marginally profitable. Next slide, please. So while these are important and positive developments, the ambition of the reform is not yet fully realized due to insufficient implementation. Many examples could be mentioned, but to keep to my time, I will just select a few. Next slide, please. Despite the legally binding deadline to achieve the FMSY exploitation rate by 2015, where possible, and by 2020 at the very latest for all stocks, the European Commission has continued to propose and the Council has continued to adopt fishing limits that exceed the best available scientific advice. And while this has been decreasing for stocks that have MSY-based advice, it must be noted that many stocks do not have MSY-based advice. And in these instances where we have less knowledge, management should be more cautious. But year after year, and even after the 2020 deadline, the Council has used the lack of MSY advice to continue setting multiple TACs in excess of scientifically advised levels. Furthermore, even some stocks that do have MSY-based advice continue to be overfished because they have been so overexploited that the advice is for zero catches. Because rather than taking action to rebuild their abundance between 2014 and 2020, member states have continued to overfish those stocks. And on top of this, the Council has repeatedly adopted quota top-ups to account for the landing obligation, while in fact the widespread lack of compliance with the landing obligation is well known again leading to overfishing. Next slide, please. One approach that should have helped with the implementation of the CFP's requirements was regionalization. During the reform, it was recognized that there should be EU-wide management objectives, such as ending overfishing, gradually eliminating discards, or minimizing impacts on marine ecosystems, but that achieving these objectives would probably need different measures in different reason, uh, regions. But what happened instead? Each 
of the multiannual plans that have been adopted so far have introduced provisions that weaken the objectives of the CFP. Moreover, the multiannual plans themselves do not contain measures that are particularly adapted to that ecosystem or that fishery. They simply create a process for member states to come to an agreement at regional level on management measures. And this process has been primarily used to adopt measures related to the landing obligation, which in practice has mostly meant adopting exemptions to the landing obligation. Next slide, please. Regionalization has also been particularly unhelpful when it comes to adopting measures to address fisheries impacts on marine biodiversity and habitats. The European Court of Auditors has highlighted how the policy framework is all there. We have EU laws that require the protection of marine biodiversity and we have articles in the CFP that say that fisheries management should contribute to this. But the CFP's tools, such as Article 11, are being used by member states to simply stop the adoption of any meaningful fisheries management measures for nature conservation. Next slide, please. One final element I would like to mention relates to climate change. The word climate does not appear once in the CFP basic regulation. But the ocean has absorbed 90%, 9-0, of the excess heat that we have pumped into the atmosphere. And we know that marine life is essential to the ocean's ability to keep performing this buffering function. And we also know that fisheries both have an impact on and are impacted by climate change. Next slide, please. So where does this leave us? The 2013 reform resulted in a highly ambitious policy framework, but in the last eight years, the EU has failed to fully implement it. So now we have a choice. We can go back to the drawing board and start thinking of a new reform, which would take years and generate a huge amount of instability, or we can make up for lost time and fully implement the provisions of the current CFP. Initiating a reform at this stage would be a mistake. If there are issues relating to implementation that need to be addressed, this can be done through revising other instruments, such as the multi-annual plans. The European Commission is also going to propose a new nature restoration law and an action plan to conserve fisheries resources and protect marine ecosystems. And these are opportunities for the European Parliament to demand fisheries management measures that protect marine life, rebuild fish populations, and deliver strong climate action. Next slide, please. Mr. Chairman, I would like to finish my presentation by acknowledging my NGO colleagues. In the summer of last year, we have jointly developed a position paper which has been shared with this committee and which was the basis for this presentation. Our joint message is clear. The CFP remains a good legal framework for fisheries management, but lacks adequate implementation, as well as control and enforcement. Addressing these shortcomings is critical now, and certainly before any future revision of the policy is considered. The necessary tools to address these implementation gaps already exist within the policy itself or in other current or upcoming policy initiatives. And now, is not the time to launch yet another lengthy legislative process, but to fulfill the existing commitments. In light of the climate and biodiversity crisis, there is really no time to waste. Final slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention and please allow me, Mr. Chairman, to also thank the interpreters. Merci, Madame Coelho. Thank you very much, Ms. Coelho. Exactly 10 minutes. That's excellent. We're now going to move on to the last presentation for this first panel. So it's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Uh, Clara Ulrich. She is the Deputy Head of Science at IFREMER, and she's also in charge of the Scientific Committee on Fisheries. Ah, it's, Europe, it's a European committee nonetheless, isn't it? So anyway, madam, it's over to you. Yes, my name is Clara Ulrich. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'll just quickly go through the first few slides. Just some basic information. 
but as usual we need predictability and we need uh, to adjust to a complex reality now the msy theory is basically that if the ocean was a jar then we're talking about the amount of food that is within this jar and it also reflects the capacity of our fishing and where it would remain a uh, sustainable uh, level within which the fish population would not degrade and uh, moving on to the next slide so to reach msy we have four elements that we need to talk on i think it's quite clear but nonetheless if we don't have fish if we don't have fishers we don't have managers or scientists it will be very difficult to achieve this objective everyone has their role to play in terms of analyzing the reality analyzing their capacities and then deciding how they can contribute to sustainable fisheries now this is of course been said often there is a high degree of uncertainty things are changing all the time temperatures uh fish stocks what we want to eat what way we find to eat um and of course this is changing all the time and everything is interconnected as it was also said science cannot predict everything at a biological scale so if we're trying to say that um we can deal with everything with science what we need to do is we need to integrate risk into fisheries management so that we can have fisheries systems that actually take into account that things change from one day to another so when we're talking about the msy ranges that was exactly that an attempt to set up a framework within which this variability can exist and nature can in fact uh, act as she does now let me quickly go through this because the speaker before me have already talked about this quite a bit so we have definitely made significant progress in terms of uh, biomass increases even if we do and don't haven't reached bmsy we have to see that there has been an improvement in stocks and some of them are definitely at the biomass biological limits we've also talked about the landing obligation i don't want to really repeat uh, myself you see these uh, pictures have been drawn up uh, by region and as you can see there is decreases in certain areas but it's very important here to mention as well that there is a high degree of uncertainty about whether the landing obligation is actually effective we don't really know what's going on there it's very difficult to understand what's happening in the operations that are exempted and there have not been any major changes in practices so i think everyone will agree that this is an obligation that for the moment at least has not has not necessarily shown its effect now another point that we come back to quite often perhaps me that is becoming uh a more important now is catch size structure for each stock for for the five main stocks in europe we really need to calculate and see what would give us the maximum yield with of course better protection of uh, juveniles that's green uh, change in uh, shift that's blue and uh, a mat which is uh, a maturity as well and so that would be very interesting and here you can see that the how the green and the blue uh, graphs actually relate to each other moving on now if you come back to catch size structure if we let fish actually grow before we catch them not only does this completely align with the objectives of the cfp and the technical regulation but in fact it is something that uh, has another advantage that's perhaps not understood very well and that it also positively affects msy because if we in let fish grow the value of the msy also rises the example that i have here here we have a uh, uh, fish mortality around the black dot there 
and we're looking at about uh, three years here and thus we are seeing that only 70 percent of the maximum production would actually reach the necessary maturity so if we actually let the fish grow till five six years instead of just three years not only would we have a uh, uh, 0.5 msy which would be much more interesting uh, and we would also have pollock that is suitable for human consumption. If you look at the selections made here, there are a number of win-win situations that could actually be leveraged where we could uh, produce more for human consumption and also protect juveniles. And now when we're looking at socio-economic uh, policy and sciences as well, now why is this so difficult? Why is it so difficult? Why are there so many counter incentives? Why is it that sometimes we can make things happen, but we don't really actually find a way to turn this into the change that we need? I think that we have to talk about long-term management plans, and I think that it has to be a progressive transition uh, towards uh, better and more sustainable fishing. Next slide. So the last bit of my time, I would like to look at the future. It's quite a long-term perspective because we've just had a report on uh, the CFP and it's clear that uh, there is still work to be done. There's also a scientific article that talks about resilience and profit from um, fisheries. Next slide. And here, this is the, the theoretical graph. Because of climate change, there are going to be variabilities and things will, the MSY will drop and that took quicker. This is because when the ocean is less healthy, you have fewer juveniles that actually grow to adults. If it's uh, warmer, the ocean is warmer, there's a lower level of oxygen and fish find it difficult to grow. So there's a number of different impacts on fisheries and other uh, aspects as well that are going to affect fish populations and therefore we will have less fish available for fisheries and uh, for human consumption. Now we're talking about major percentages here between 5 and 8% of productivity loss per degree of warming. So this consequence is definitely going to remain but how the mathematical value changes that is something that is going to affect the quantity of sustainable THC. Now next here, just to let you know that Europe is not going to be worst affected uh, by all of these changes. Of course, in tropical areas, the effect is going to be much greater. But of course, uh, things will very quickly expand to Europe as well. It's not um, caricature really, but it's in fact a, a bit uh, pessimistic almost. So of the four elements that we talked about in the beginning, what's going to remain? We want the fish to remain, of course, that's a key element in terms of food security and survival of the human race, which is a healthy source of protein with a low carbon impact. But will there be fish? Will there be fishermen? Will there be some managing governance left that will allow us to deal with this increasing variability? When we're talking about edible fish, basically, if uh, these fish, uh, they disappear, they're uh, replaced by jellyfish and uh, other uh, species that are not necessarily viable as food. Next slide, please. So here now I have two scenarios for you. From the Gasquel publication. So basically, it uh, gives us an idea of what exactly are we doing here if we don't actually take action, if we just let this variability run its course, if we let climate change gallop ahead, things are going to become more and more difficult. In spite of the fact that we might have some degree of idea that this is going to happen, the variability will be so large that we will not be able to deal with it. This is going to lead to significant economic uh, harm and it's also going to weaken the governance system to be able to take long-term decisions. So here we end up in a relatively pessimistic uh, scenario. However, 
we take an ecosystem based fishing approach where we're talking about high selectivity and protection of juvenile juveniles where we take a precautionary management approach etc if we have a better conflict management as well as better uh, fleet based approaches as well then we might actually be able to build on current progress and we would have a greater possibility of continuing with um, healthy fishing ecosystem in 2015 i will just uh, quickly come to my conclusion because i know i've gone over time so exactly so we need to go from sustainable fisheries to sustainable and resilient fisheries we have to reduce the impact on the ecosystem and the fishing ecosystem of course there's a lot to be done there are a number of different elements existing today that would allow us to reach sustainable or rather more sustainable uh, fisheries with a low impact but we really need to work on incentives be this economic or otherwise that would allow us to really all row in the same direction to prepare for the future and it's very important to say that sustainable fisheries today is one of the preconditions for resilient and sustainable fisheries of tomorrow thank you thank you ms ulrik and sorry about uh, uh, cutting you off thank you very much for your presentation and now i hand over to our colleagues in the room uh, well in the room and connected mr myanmar gracias presidente y gracias también thank you chair Thank you very much to the three speakers, or uh, rather four speakers. I thought they were all very interesting. Now, I have to admit, though, some of the points do need to be analyzed further by us. The presentations were often quite quick, and some of the slides were quite dense. So I think we need to go back and just look at them one more time. But I do understand that if you have just ten uh, minutes, uh, you have to really get to the main points. especially miss uh, ulrich's presentation uh, there was a lot of interesting information there need to look at that i think gabriel mato will also pitch on this but uh, i think i'm not speaking rubbish if i say that the pesh committee has always said that the cfp evaluation has to lead to a reform of the cfp the commission of course does not share this uh, position they are basically asking us to rethink everything uh, and there are so many uh, elements so many developments that are forcing us to rethink where we have brexit climate change the logistical crisis the rising uh, fuel costs uh, and the rising energy costs in terms of fish storage so i think we do need to take up all of this we have a number of uh, environmental as well as uh, economic reasons where we need to think things I do think that we need a legislative uh, reform of the CFP. Uh, let's see what the Commission says in their report once it's uh, um, uh, published. I understand what Mr. Gard said as well. Ms. Coelho had a different opinion, but nonetheless, I do understand that this is a discussion we need to have. And I would like to focus on one specific point: that the CFP reform needs to be a social reform. Uh, sorry, the chair interrupts. We have ten people asking for the floor, so if you could please keep it short, just so you know. Okay, I'll be quicker then. So we need a social reform of the CFP. We need social and economic performance that actually makes sense for fishermen. From the Galician Fishermen's uh, Council, it's the leading fishing region in. and i hope that their conclusions will be taken on board we need a modern comparative fishery sector especially one that upholds social conditions now a uh, fishing capacity i think this is something that was talked about in the presentations as well mr jensen talked about this as well what are we talking about well we need to reform the concept of capacity we have to go beyond just tons of catch we need to mr garat said that the fishing population more than 58% are between 40 and 64 years old we need a generational renewal in the sector and to do this we need to change the concept of fisheries capacity then we need a level playing field so in some way or the other we need to take into account the european union's trade policies within the cfp 
uh, only those operators from third countries that accept the principles of um, fair and balanced clean play uh, can actually have their products enter the European Union. We also have to talk about food quality and uh, the, um, operations that respect ILO conventions. So I think that this level playing field is absolutely key and is the only way where we can reform the CFP. Man Thank you, Paco. Manuel. Muito obrigado, Sr. Presidente. Thank you very much, Chair. I would like to begin by thanking the speakers. The different visions that they presented, some might seem contradictory, but I think they're all true in a way. We might read the same numbers in different ways. And I think that we would nonetheless agree that the implementation of the CFP has led to progress in the sector in the European Union and has led to an increase in sustainability as well. A sustainability in terms of the environment. There we're seeing how we're getting closer to uh, MSY, especially in the Atlantic. It's been uh, an increase in sustainability of economic and social uh, aspects as well because environmental sustainability is not possible without economic and social sustainability. Now, there are many measures that fishermen don't really understand. They see it as uh, excessive red tape for an activity that's already very difficult. And there I share um, my, the opinion of my colleague, Mr. Millen Mo, where we need to go beyond just tons of catch. We have to talk about safety and certainty for uh, the fishermen on board. That's absolutely key. In in the year 2020, a large portion of the MSY stocks in the Atlantic and the large majority in the Mediterranean are really far away from MSY levels. So this is a topic that we cannot get away from. There's no way we can hide ourselves from this reality. And this is a major concern uh, with an increase in uh, pollution as well as the ocean temperatures. We've seen stocks where biological changes are so severe that we really need to rethink what we can do. I think we all need to get together and think about what we need to do. And I think uh, the conclusion we would come to is we need to change the CFP. And it cannot just be about fishing more, but about fishing better. And lastly, I just wanted to say that in spite of everything that's happening in uh, my country, Portugal and Spain have come up with a multi-annual plan for fisheries, something that's very important for us. And this is something that have led to uh, many years, like after many years of very scarce sardine fishing, we have now been able to reach a viability in terms of uh, sardine stocks. So we need more experience exactly like this so that we can intelligently use European funds to support uh, the communities actually doing the job. Thank you. Merci, uh, Manuel. <coughs> Moi, je prends... Thank you, Manuel. I'll be taking the floor for, before we knew. So thank you very much for uh, each of the four speakers, although I've thanked them before. It's very interesting. And indeed, as Manuel said, there is this contradictory aspect, which is food for thought on our part. Now, I have taken note of an expression which I think is quite pertinent. Mr. Sverdrov Jensen said it's a jungle of waivers, jungle of derogations. So this is a question to all of the speakers, in particular, Mrs. Enrique. I had an opportunity to ask Professor Gasquil whether all stocks can be fished sustainably at the same time and in the long term. It's a nearly mathematical question, really, in a system with perhaps multiple variables. But can they be fished sustainably in view of interactions between species? And indeed, the underlying question is, are we asking scientists the right questions? You know, we put scientific opinion on a pedestal, but we also have it at the heart of our thoughts. But if we don't, well, 
if we also included the socioeconomic data, and we, we can do this, but perhaps we could have a model of socioeconomic factors in decisions. And when the Commission proposes a digital twin of the ocean, well, what is the point of that, if not to shed light on political decision making? So to want to have a reform with a number of objectives, which some may call impossible. But I think that the idea is that precisely because they're impossible, we are running around in circles and we're dissatisfied. We haven't been able to achieve our goals for a number of fish stocks. We have climatic issues and climatic goals that we have a hard time keeping with. And then we have fishermen who don't understand, as Mr. Hedrick Jensen said, rules cannot be followed and understood. So if they're not understood, they won't be followed. So when Mrs. Hendricks, you said that there's a doubt on the effectiveness of the requirement, landing requirements. So the question is, are we asking the right scientific questions? Now, Mrs. Scott Keller. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to all the speakers. That was indeed uh, very interesting. I do think we have a severe problem in our seas. Uh, well, we all know that with a, a big loss of biodiversity, a lot of things are going wrong, which is partly due to overfishing, as has been mentioned. Um, but of course, also there's other uh, effects on our seas and on the fish stocks, such as pollution, the climate change, uh, climate catastrophe, one should say, that has been mentioned. So I think we need to work together in order to make sure that we have biodiversity, that we have fish stocks also for the future, because it wouldn't be fair either for this generation to catch away all that what was called a very valuable protein uh, for future generations not to have any left and to have void seas with uh, a couple of jellyfish um, and all the problems attached to that. So I think that's the way in which we should go and that's the way in which the CFP was meant to work. Um, and I'm not really fond of the idea of throwing it overboard when we see so severe problems of implementation. So there the question would rather be to the speakers, how can we improve the implementation? Uh, how can we make sure that all those loopholes are also closed? I have, I mean, derogations were called for as a problem, but if the derogations are all exemptions from this and that, then maybe indeed we should cut some of those exemptions. Maybe that makes it easier. I've understood from the speakers from the fisheries industry mainly that you don't want any regulation, but I mean, all sectors have regulation and sure regulations uh, you know, are certainly always a bit difficult, but everyone has to follow uh, regulations. There are regulations in all sectors for good reasons. And even though you might say, okay, maybe this or that might not be perfect, but to say, okay, we don't understand them. I mean, sorry, but that's, <laughs> I don't really see that so much as an argument because the CFP is there for everyone to, to read um, and there is help uh, to understand it. So I, if you say you would like to see specifically different regulation, and please go ahead and explain, but also uh, I'm sure you share the aim of having fish stocks also in the future, and I think that needs to be uh, reflected. Also, um, one of the speakers mentioned that we cannot afford not to reform, but then again, we've seen those numbers saying that the fleet is now much more profitable than before, even during corona times. So um, that seems to be of a benefit also for the fleet. I have a question also, um, how the speakers think, uh, maybe mainly uh, Ms. Coelho, um, how climate change can be integrated into the governance systems that we have um, if we don't want to go for reform of the CFP, what other tools can we use for that? And thank you so much again for your contributions. Merci, Madame Keller. Thank you, Mrs. Keller. Jan Bertrosen. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the speakers, too, for their very clear presentations. I have a question in relation to the landing obligation. The first two speakers both said that the landing obligation is a measure which isn't workable, and when I talk to people from the sector, they tell me the same. And what you've been saying also ties in with what we said as the European Parliament in the Garda report, we put the finger on 
the uh, issues and asked the Commission to carry out uh, an assessment of the landing obligation and then possibly carry out a revision of it, but an assessment first. Now, my question to the speakers is, would you agree that this landing obligation is a measure which isn't workable and which really uh, should just be scrapped entirely? It's also difficult to explain to uh, our fishermen and women that uh, uh, they're, they're obliged to land undersized live fish. So maybe the various speakers could shed some light on that for us. Thank you. Merci. Je passe, uh, la parole à... Thank you. Mrs. Carvalho. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, I would like to thank all the uh, speakers for the very interesting uh, presentation. And I have a question to, to, to the speakers that want to answer. Uh, my question is about the data. Uh, many sectors are going through a, a very important transformation with the application of data science. Uh, also is happening, starting happening in fishery sector, but it can be uh, much more used. So my question, uh, what will be the benefits? In my own view, it will be a lot of benefits because we will have uh, very important information uh, to, to, to support the decision. My second question, how do you foresee the reaction and the barriers um, of the sector to, to that? And my last question, how this can be introdu introduced in the regulations that we are working in order to make sure that we make use of the best information that we can have available. Thank you very much. Merci, cher collègue. Je passe... Thank you, colleagues. Now, Mrs. Carmen Avram, go ahead. Thank uh, our experts today for sharing their views on this very important subject, the common fisheries policy. I think we can all agree that the common fisheries policy means not only sustainable exploitation of fish stocks and respecting ecosystems, but also supporting the sector with without affecting its profitability and the standard of living of fishermen. And the issue of profitability of the sector, but probably the survival of the sector, must be addressed at this time when energy and fuel prices exploded and the war in Ukraine even led to the interruption of fishing activities in the Black Sea, for example. We need to ensure the food security of the Europeans and the fishing industry is vital. Under these uh, conditions, I would like to ask Mr. Garat and Mr. Jensen, how do your organizations see it possible to at least maintain the standard of living of our fishermen, which is one of the objectives of the common fisheries policy, when they had to face a health pandemic, rising energy and fuel uh, prices, and a war at the eastern borders of uh, Europe, can we still guarantee the food security of the Europeans under these circumstances? Um, a very important issue of the CAP is the environmental aspect and the biodiversity protection of our seas and oceans. Uh, I would like to ask Mrs. Coelho and Mrs. Ulrich how the CFP requirements should address the Green Deal strategy's targets without putting in danger the fisheries sectors at this point. Do you think uh, to rediscuss postponing or recalibrating some of the targets would be an option? Is it feasible to temporarily reconsider the Green Deal strategies in order to guarantee the European food security under these very complicated uh, circumstances? Thank you. Merci, cher collègue. Je passe la parole. Thank you, Caroline Rose. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et merci. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to all the speakers. I'm somewhat surprised at hearing from some things that really don't tally with what I've found in the field when I meet with fishermen that I meet with regularly. Now, the fishermen I've met with are aware that they are dependent on marine uh, ecosystems. They defend a rigorous management of fish stocks also because they can see positive long-term effects, but those 
who are supposed to re represent them here in Brussels tell us that we mustn't follow scientific opinions and certain things need to be optional and fishers should be able to throw even more fish back into the sea. And I really don't understand where this huge gap comes from. Now, the two presentations just demonstrated that the CFP has functioned in terms of areas in which they have been applied in their entirety. Fishery, fishing has gone down in the Atlantic. We're a bit behind in the Mediterranean. But what I hear from the field that they're very critical in landing about landing requirements. So I would like to know what Clara, Ulrich, and Vera Cuello have to say about this. Does it work? What should we do about the numerous exceptions that have been granted? And I also take note of the importance of an ecosystem-based report of a precautionary principle in fish management in order to ensure the very survival of the fisheries industry in the coming years. Because if we run out of fish in the sea, we will also run out of fishermen. So when it comes to the question of age and size of fish, which we all too often forget, to what extent is the reduction and the life expectancy of fish going to have an impact on the abundance of fish stocks? And how does it reduce the economic profitability of fisheries? And then one final point that I wanted to raise is a point on um, pelagic trawlers. We have studies on pelagic trawlers when, with respect to resources and marine biodiversity, and they show that the rates are very high when it comes to bycatches in this type of fisheries. The impact that these bottom trawlers have on the marine bottom. And there was also a study in the magazine Nature which demonstrated a tremendous climatic impact that these fish fisheries have in because of the movement of sediments that are caused by their nets, which and these sediments are carbon sinks, and when they move, this liberates colossal amounts of CO2. So I would like to know what do the scientists who are present today um, think about this, and how can we solve this problem? So just one final word. I don't think we need to have a new CFP reform, but I think we should at least implement the one we already have. Thank you. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Mr. Matum. Yes, thank you. I thought I would take the floor at the very end of the hearing, but just... Oh, actually, all right, well, then I'll give the floor to Mr. Bartolo before I give it to you, but it's really because it's you. Mr. Barto, then... Mrs. D'Amato, and then Mrs. O'Sullivan. Mr. Bartolo, you have the floor. Mr. Bartolo. Mr. Bartolo? Mr. Bartolo, could you please tell me? I don't have my accent Italian sufficiently well disguised. The Italian accent is not quite up to snuff. Madame O'Sullivan. Mrs. O'Sullivan, are you there? Yes, good morning. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, I'm here, and um, if I can wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. It's our national holiday here in Ireland. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, so, look, to me, the problem and weakness seems to be the implementation of the CFP. We hear from the European Court of Auditors that the policy, policy objectives in the CFP are good, um, that they can fulfil existing commitments. Um, and the problem seems to be that the current, the CFP is not being implemented. Implemented. Article 8 of the CFP hasn't been implemented, and that's um, in terms of fisheries recovery. Uh, we have Article 12, uh, we know has uh, only seen limited use, so that means we're not uh, protecting marine biological resources properly. Um, Mr. Um, Miller-Mon spoke about the social aspect of, of CFP, and this CFP, particularly in, in relation to Article 17, uh, which where we should see a just and fair transition isn't uh, being properly implemented. There isn't a level playing field. We know that. So um, that is a weakness. If it was implemented, we might see something better. The revised control regulation is still not in force. 
when are we going to see that? So there's so many aspects of the CFB that are simply not being implemented. Um, the uh, MFAF um, supports climate and biodiversity spending. So my question to, um, the, to the presenters, which I thank very much for your presentations, is there is a va money available in terms of climate and biodiversity spending. How can this be best used uh, in order to, um, uh, to support sustainability and resilience in fisheries, in terms of fishery stocks, in terms of supporting um, the uh, sector? Uh, but for me at the moment, it's just implement, implement, implement. We're not doing it. And that is the main problem on the table. Thank you very much, Chair. Merci, Grace. Uh, je passe la parole à... Thank you, Grace. Rosa. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you also to the speakers. Let me go straight away to my two questions. My first question is in relation to Article 17. And I think it's an, a fundamental instrument to realize the social and environmental ambitions of the common fisheries uh, policy. It has a, a good impact on resources and on employment. And it also ties in with transparency and responsibility on the part of member states when sharing out fishing effort and quotas. But unfortunately, the information available in relation to the criteria used for allocating quotas uh, is scarce. Uh, there's therefore very little information in relation to fishing effort. The second question is in relation to the social dimension, which is important to us, and that comes that ties in with the diversification of income. We think that uh, the sector needs to become more resilient to uh, the uh, various shocks that we see, such as the energy crisis uh, that has now been prompted by the war. But for certain countries, this isn't important. They only spend 2 million euro uh, under the uh, resources. And I'd like to hear from the speakers what their experience is here and whether they have any examples of best practices for us. In closing, let me then say that... Uh, uh, I have the impression that in the decision-making uh, procedures, small fisheries representatives are really not included much uh, and are not consulted. Again, could I ask the speakers what their experience is there? And then, finally, on Article 5 and the landing obligation. Now, the effectiveness of that apparently is limited. But because it's not respected, uh, therefore uh, unlawful discards still happen. Now these are statements uh, from EFCA and also others. So what to do there then? Thank you very much, Rosa. I'll now give the floor to Pietro Bartolo. Can you hear me? You can? Excellent. Uh, I do apologize for not being uh, online earlier. I'll just speak to one issue, which is the management of fisheries through uh, uh, multi-annual plans. Uh, that is pro problematic and we need to rethink it uh, completely. The multi-annual plans do not uh, achieve the overall objectives of the CFP and I think that's pretty clear from the first few years uh, where that instrument has been used. There's a constant reduction of the fishing effort and that over a number of subsequent years and that puts the entire sector under a lot of pressure. A lot of jobs have been lost as a result over the past two years and local fishing communities have been left without alternatives. This runs counter to the social economic objectives uh, uh, of the CFP, which are in Article 2.7. So we need to carry out a complete and accurate analysis of all of the fishing stocks and look at the effects of restrictions that are put in place. And then, of course, the fleet would have to uh, adjust to that. But uh, we also need to 
uh, analyze what can be done so that our, our stocks are sustainable again. But in doing that, we need to look at the socio-economic dimension of the measures put in place. But we also need to look at all of the other factors uh, that uh, uh, have a negative impact on fishing stocks. Uh, uh, microplastic uh, pollution, for example, climatic events, and so on, which are factors which are currently not sufficiently taken into account in any assessment. If we look at how the instrument, the management instrument, has been set up and applied, it is all too rigid and doesn't uh, allow for a gradual introduction of rules. And the management tool is also based on data from previous years and therefore do not take into account any improvements that have happened uh, in uh, the meantime. So, as I see it, uh, I think it's important to apply an ecosystem approach to the management of stocks and we need increased investment into research and practices so uh, that fisheries can uh, occur but uh, with clear rules that apply. But of course we need to have and ensure that people have the right to sail out to sea. Uh, that has to be a right which is enshrined, and we need a fairer and just system. Thank you, Pietro. We don't have a, a great deal of time left, but I'll give the floor now to Gabriel. Yes, thank you. First of all, um, a comment for the speakers and then also for the colleagues who've made comments. Now, I think that it's very important to have the opportunity to listen to everyone and find out where they're going because I think that we politicians who have to take decisions will take better decisions if we have the support from comments made by people who actually know what the situation is. And so it seems that there are two distinct blocks. Um, and we'll see the other panel. There's two sides. One is the fishers and their rep fishermen and their representatives. And then on the other hand, we have others who have other qualities and agree in some cases and don't agree in others. Now, I think that in the CFP, if we have uh, excessively ambitious objectives or not. Now, if our objectives are excessively ambitious, then in 2013 we had excessively rigid and unrealistic standards, then it would be too expected what would happen, that it wouldn't be possible to meet deadlines or even complete the objective. So there are two fundamental issues. One is more sustainable development and um, bycatches. And now, of course, these objectives are laudable, but if they're not attainable, all they do is build mistrust, mistrust in us, we who set these objectives, we politicians, but also um, society will also lack trust in us because we don't um, meet our promises. And, and I think that in this case, this is what we really need to work on. And certainly in this reform, or at least in this analysis, what's been done is um, some speakers have been overly focused on environmental considerations because ultimately we've reduced the entire reform of the CFP and the entire analysis uh, down to two issues, maximum sustainable catch and landing regulations and nothing else. And then the other issues are environmental. Now, I was, my attention was drawn by an expression which was that we're in experiencing a biodiversity crisis. And that's the problem. So, yeah, I think we are in a biodiversity crisis, but I think there's another more important crisis, which is a social and economic crisis. We've had the figures that show zero generational handover. And and we keep talking about the environment. We talk about biodiversity, but not very much about economic and social considerations. And so I think that that is also not a good thing. And it's not good because it's true that the debate that we have here and is going we're going to have to decide whether we want to reform the CFP and also whether an implementation as some defend of the CFP itself is even sufficient. Now I've always said that it's very difficult or even impossible to implement objectives which are completely unattainable. So 
if if that's what you have, you really can't make the impossible possible. So with the objective of improving fish stocks, well, without a doubt, that's one of the objectives. But we also need to have social and economic objectives as well. And to that end, it's fundamental, among other things, because as we're seeing, the issue of food security is based on fishermen. They're the ones that are making it possible to for us to have food security. And I've said it many times, let's try to strike a balance between sustainability, environmental sustainability, yes, but also economic and social sustainability. And I think that the chairman is giving me a red light. So we'll have a final comment later on. Thank you. Merci, Gabriel. On a une deuxième part. Thank you, Gabriel. There'll be a, a second part to our hearing, too. We've had a very important and interesting discussion with many speakers, and I'm going to give the floor to the various speakers. And what I just wanted to do was to make sure that you can only that you only speak for a maximum of four minutes. You don't have to answer everything, but perhaps you could reply to the most pertinent points. So, Mr. Gad, you have the floor. Go ahead. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for those comments and questions. I'll be speaking in Spanish because when I hear particularly Mrs. Rose and Mrs. Guerrero, um, perhaps the explanation wasn't sufficient, but there may be a predisposition to not listen or understand what I'm saying. So I'll speak Spanish and see if I can be better understood. Now, um, it would seem that the sector doesn't want regulations. We don't want to have fish. We don't want to have uh, to apply the CFP. But no, that's not it at all. What we think is first that there is no need for radical reform. And if there is, what we need is to focus reform on specific aspects, as I said in my presentation, which are essential to ensure that this actually works. And for it to work, we need to ensure the protection of biodiversity, the sustainable use of natural resources, and food security. So we believe that we need to strike a balance between these three pillars. And to do this, and as was said, we need a policy which is rational and feasible, and aspects that have to do with maximum sustainable yield, as was pointed out, and landing requirements, in our view, are neither rational nor applicable, and they should be changed. They should be improved. We do want to have rules governing them, but they do need to be feasible, because otherwise what we will achieve is something that's filled with sanctions by the member states because it's impossible to comply with these rules. What we need is a fisheries policy which thinks about humans, human beings, fishers. The human element is essential. We need to redefine the fisheries capacity. We to renew the fisheries capacity, and that's essential. Otherwise, we're going to have problems with a generational handover and other issues. Well, we need to have a situation where we make decisions not based on emotions or campaigns, as occurred with the reform of the CFP in, by, it, by certain NGOs. We need to be based on science, based on socioeconomic impact, and based on something that can actually be implemented. And then it's also extremely important to ensure that we have a level level playing field. Otherwise, in response to Mrs. Abrams' question, what will happen with respect to the prices of fuel, the war, well, we can hold tight. But if we don't take urgent steps, the fishery sector is going to die. And perhaps there will be very happy NGOs because many of these fishing boats will disappear. And certainly in, par in Parliament, there will be many people who will be happy. But I can assure you that fishing communities who are so dependent on this activity are not going to be quite that happy. And as I always say, this is the healthiest animal protein in the world, and it has the best carbon imprint in its production. So if we continue along these lines and we reduce the number of fishermen and fishing vessels, ultimately we're going to be dependent on imports. And for sure, the, the, that will not comply with the high standards that we have in the European Union. And I'm sorry my presentation was so dense, but to talk about so many things in 10 minutes is very difficult. So. Um, you can receive a copy of their presentation and 
this, it, what we need is a surgical pinpointed reform of certain fundamental aspects. Thank you. Bien. Merci, Monsieur Garat. Je passe... Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Garat. I'll now give the floor. And as usual, I'm managing so many things, so I've forgotten the name, but it's Esben Sverdrup Jensen. I do apologize, sir, but you have the floor for four minutes, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. President, and thanks uh, for the questions from uh, from the members of the of the committee. I think they're all very relevant. As uh, Javier said, we only had uh, 10 minutes uh, to uh, to make our case. It's an extremely uh, brief uh, session for such an important uh, uh, topic. Uh, unfortunately, yes, there was some maybe some misunderstandings. I think that both Javier and I made it very clear from from the very first slides that we need a management system. We're not looking for modern fishermen are not looking for free fishing without rights, without legislation, without limitations. There's no way of investing in a fishing vessel. There's no way of, of predicting the future. There's no way of getting the next generation on, on board your vessels. So we very much need legislation. We very much need a management system that works, that protects the fishermen uh, and their businesses. If you cannot trust what everybody else is doing, if you have no faith in the legislation, then there's no way of, of going down to the bank, getting a loan, a mortgage for your next vessel. And all fishermen want to invest in their businesses. They want to be more modern, safer, create a better working environment on board. That's also the need of, of modern uh, young uh, people moving into the sector. So those are fundamental issues. The sector wants to be green, but as we said and explained, we are, there are limitations in the current legislation that makes it impossible for us to invest in green technology. The, the limitations there just, just don't allow us with the capacity, uh, etc. So there is a need for a reform, as Javier said, a pinpointed reform. Learn from the mistakes of the current legislation. Let's create something that is more coherent where there's a red line through all of the legislation from the CFP to the technical measures, the control regulation, capacity regulation, all of these things. The alternative that's suggested by the Commission and supported by, by the NGO committee uh, is to create a, a patchwork blanket of things here and there, changes here, changes there, up and down. It's impossible to work with for the fishermen. They need predictability. We need something to look ahead, to create a platform for the next generation for the green transition. If we just implement the current CFP with a lot of derogations, as has been the case so far, with a patchwork of different regulations pointing in one direction, another direction, etc., then there is no future. That's what we're looking for. We're not look. I mean, we agree. All fishermen agree with the principles of the CFP, with the principle of not throwing away good fish. That's clear to everyone. Fishermen live from the sea, from the ecosystem, etc. But we can't live with the current legislation. That's why we want to change it, and we want to change it in a coherent way where there's a match between what is in the CFP, what is in the control regulation, what's in the technical measures, what's in the marine spatial planning, all of these legislative measures. Legislation that paves the way for green transition for the fleet that adapts, allows us to adapt to climate change. As was mentioned by my colleague from Oceana, there's nothing about climate in the CFP. 10, 15 years ago, when we talked about the current CFP, when we started developing it, when we read the, the Green Book was made, climate change wasn't really a topic. It is now. It's the number one topic in the world. How can we agree to just carry on with a CFP that's already outdated and then continue this for another 10 years without reacting to climate change and to all of those issues that have just been mentioned. I think it would be just not prudent. So let's start. Merci, right now. We are going Thank to you. the end of your time. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Madame Coelho, vous avez la parole pour... You have the floor, Mrs. Coelho. Four minutes for you too. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the members of the committee for their questions. I'm afraid time is limited, so I won't be able to answer in detail, but I'm always happy to have further bilateral discussions if, uh, if that is desirable. Um, I took good note of the many points that were made about socio-economic concerns and the socio-economic performance of the common fisheries policy, uh, as well as about the points that were made about recent acute crisis in terms of fuel prices, food security considerations, etc., etc. So I do want to reiterate what I tried to put across in my presentation. It is not that the CFP should not have a socioeconomic uh, pillar or a very important consideration. What I'm trying to say is that environmental sustainability is the necessary basis for good socioeconomic performance. If we do not have healthy marine ecosystems, healthy and abundant fish stocks, we cannot have a profitable, secure fishing sector that delivers food security for our population and around the world. So that is the point that is necessary to retain. Many of these um, instruments and objectives in the CFP are not mere philosophical principles. They are absolutely necessary if we want to achieve the entirety of the objectives of the CFP, including the socio-economic objectives. I will leave the question on whether all stocks can be exploited at FMSY at the same time to Clara to respond to, but I do want to pose another question, which is why can't we exploit some fish stocks below FMSY levels? Why is it the solution to over-exploit the stocks instead of protecting the most vulnerable stocks. And indeed, this is an area where the landing obligation has unfortunately had a very undesirable effect, which is it flipped the narrative. So it was introduced as an attempt to minimize, ultimately eliminate unwanted catches, and those unavoidable un uh, unwanted catches should then be landed. But it went from that, let's avoid unwanted catches in order to protect vulnerable stocks, let's manage the mixed fisheries on the basis of the most vulnerable stock. That got flipped into, let's sacrifice the most vulnerable stock in order to max maximize catches of others. And this just leads to a cascade of overfishing because there's always a most vulnerable stock in a mixed fishery. So if we keep overexploiting the most vulnerable stock, we end up overfishing multiple stocks in the mixed fishery, which is exactly the inverse of what was desired with the landing obligation. Another point on the landing obligation and whether it is attainable or not, again, my question is, have we tried to attain it? The landing obligation was introduced in a phased manner. NGOs have alerted repeatedly to the fact that a big bang was under preparation measures to in increase selectivity, avoidance of unwanted catches, etc., were very limited, introduced very late, and in fact, most of the attention was given to how do we maintain the status quo? How do we maintain the exact same fishing patterns? How do we swap quota around, etc.? So let's try to find some solutions, but let's not fundamentally look at how we change the fishing uh, activity, the, the in order to change the way that we are catching the fish and the composition of the fish that we are uh, catching, how do we maintain destructive, unselective fishing gears like bottom trawling exactly in the same way? And this brings me to the next point, which is, it was incredibly important to we have... We have to end your intervention. I'm sorry, but yeah. we, are, we are running out of time. No problem. Sorry. Can I... Thank you, Madame Coelho. Uh, je passe la parole maintenant à Madame Ulrich. I'll hand over to Ms. Ulrich for the last contribution of four minutes, please. Oui. Uh... Yes, thank you. First off, the responses that I will give you are just in my personal capacity and not just as the Deputy Chair of Ifremera. I think it's quite important that uh, that is mentioned. That's not necessarily the uh, uh, response from my association that I work for. Firstly, what can we do? Can we actually achieve uh, MSY? Now, MSY is an objective. We will always have this variability. Sometimes things might rise, sometimes it might drop. So 
the range was basically that idea that stay more or less near MSY. One Miss Kellery also said, if we look at the US and Australia, they are points of reference there. Our uh, management objectives are a bit lo lower than MSY. The Australians, for example, have the M. EY, maximum economic yield. So the Australians are looking at the highest degree of profitability and this is a bit lower than MSY. So as such, we could very much decide to have an objective that is between FMIN and FMSY. We would have, however, a much a larger percentage of stock that would be fished within MSY. Then the next question, are we asking the right questions? Well, I think this is the greatest challenge. A landing obligation, I think, is the biggest challenge. This is the one that is being discussed the most. I think it's also the uh, feature of the CFP which was least discussed with uh, experts. Everything else, the multi-annual management plans, MSY, the technical regulation, there was a lot more interaction with experts and scientists here. With respect to the landing obligation, I really do find it difficult to understand why we want to go beyond what we've achieved today on this uh, front. I think we need to rethink our objectives. We also have to uh, think about why we want to do it. We have to avoid uh, bycatch, uh, small specimens being caught. And we have to see what other countries are doing, what's Chile doing, what's New Zealand doing. Perhaps there are other mechanisms that would afford greater flexibility. I think these are the major challenges with respect to landing obligations. Now, the impact on uh, bottom trawling and CO2 impact. Now, this article in Nature, it's quite new. It's definitely being discussed among the scientific community. These are not uh, completely stable figures just yet. But of course, there are a number of studies that show that the impact on the ocean floor is very closely related with sustainability, sustainable fishing. So uh, areas in which uh, fisheries are sustainable, they're close to MSY, they are also areas where the ocean floor is in better health. So trawling is definitely a question, but can trawling actually have an environmental impact? Uh, what sort of environment can be resilient to trawling? This also depends on the amount of trawling activity. So it's really linked to sustainable fisheries. So at the end of the day, to actually fishing a little below MSY actually has environmental, biological, economic uh, advantages, and it actually complies with the objectives of the, uh, the requirements of the Green Deal. So these are the tools that we have in our toolbox, and we have to see what we can do with them, how can we can work better with them to try and reach our objectives as well. Well, you had four minutes and so I would like to uh, stop you here. I've ended as a speaker. Thank you very much to all four speakers. I see that now that uh, parliamentary activities are resuming a bit more normally, uh, all the groups have also thought about different events on the topic where I think the speakers could perhaps go into more detail as well. So uh, we'll take a short break now, colleagues, and we'll resume at 10.50.
Chers collègues, il est 10h50, je vous propose... So, dear colleagues, it's 10.50, let's get back to work. Since the session is three hours, we will not be able to overrun in terms of interpretation. Three hours is already quite long. It's long for us, it's long for them. So, let's move on to the second part of today's session. Here we're going to talk about uh, fisheries governance today and tomorrow. Now, during the hearing, we already talked about um, regionalization of certain governance uh, measures. We have four experts once again with us. It's uh, uh, really great that we've finally been able to have hearings with the experts. I know says the chair. Looks like I'm making some mistakes. Anyway, so I will now pass on to our speakers for today. Our first speaker is Mr. Ivan Lopez van der Veen. He's the chair of the Long Distance Advisory Council for Fisheries. So you have the floor, Mr. Lopez van der Veen. Please press the speak button. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, we thank can you. see you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I start, uh, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity for participating. Ten minutes, and please, no more. No, we yes, I have know. Time. Thank you. Representing the Long Distance Advisory Council. Uh, I will focus a little bit my attention on the external dimension of the common fisheries policy, which is one of the most needed evolutions of the common revisions and obviously very relevant to the ocean governance internationally. Uh, just following in the pro preceding discussion, uh, this part actually needs reform because um, it's, uh, it was the first time that it was included in the CFP and let's say that it's not longer meeting the challenges uh, ahead for the European Union. I will start with a general uh, review of the progress and then uh, identify the needs uh, that our members uh, collectively have decided that are the most important. Regarding the external dimension of the common fisheries policy, progress has been made in terms of transparency of operations uh, of the European Union fleets. There is better accountability of use of public money through the sectorial support component of these FPAs. A higher relevance in the presence and influence of the European Union in all the RFMOs has been achieved and all member states have interests. Well, all of them, uh, all, all of the RFMOs where EU members have interests, uh, either uh, as a flag operator or as a coastal state, which makes the EU probably the, the most influential member uh, in, in RFMOs. Uh, as it, it's a member of almost all of them. Uh, there has been a lot of progress in the implementation of the uh, IUU regulation and the fisheries control regulation. And uh, together with the entry into force of the uh, sustainable management of the external European fleets, uh, this has provided certain uh, teeth to the work towards eradicating IUU uh, outside of the European waters. And is very complementary with other international texts like the uh, port state measures. The enhanced role of the uh, European Fisheries Control Agency has been very important and has had beneficial effects to improve fisheries governance and control by pooling resources of the European Union members and providing a technical expertise and representation uh, at, at control and compliance committees uh, at the RFMOs uh, such as NAFO and ICAN. Uh, progress has also been made on the increase of capacity building and coordinated trained emissions in third countries to improve the use of uh, management tools and control. And, uh, nevertheless, the EU should look at the forward, uh, forward and there is a lot that it needs to uh, equip itself and, and better itself so that it can continue to lead this charge for uh, uh, sustainable and better international fisheries. So first of all, it should lead by example and so a consistent approach to its own standards when acting in RFMOs under international conventions. It should improve the coherence between RFMO uh, measures and other international frameworks to provide a strong legal framework for the protection and conservation of sensitive species and habitats. It should translate the critical common fisheries policy objectives, including plans for a reduction of discards, data collection of bycats, precautionary ecosystem approach, etc., and include them in all sustainable fisheries partners agreements. Uh, in these, it should also embed a requirement for coastal states to improve transparency. This is the number of vessels, catches, bycatches, etc., but not only those of the European Union, which we know, but it should require that all vessels active in the water should be made public, as well as uh, other uh, agreements they might have with third countries, especially uh, in 
related in, in Africa, China's agreements are very relevant and very, uh, very dark to know. Uh, we have to achieve a full implementation here as well. We have a little bit of gap of the uh, sustainable management uh, external fit, uh, fisheries control regulation and create a more user-friendly database where that makes it possible to find fishing authorization of your vessels and non-EU waters. This uh, transparency will be very good to eliminate doubts currently uh, clouding sometimes some of these SFPAs. Uh, we should improve the member states' transparency of the activities of the European Union internal fishing fleet, and that is not all countries are as transparent as others, and make public the information uh, of who is behind the EU flag vessels as well as the activities of EU citizens on the new EU flags. This in line with a better coordination with a better standards for uh, investment uh, of European uh, citizens and companies in third countries would be very desirable. Uh, apply uh, um, with the member states a zero tolerance policy towards uh, IUU fishing in the EU market and waters, uh, and also by EU vessels and citizens. Uh, this is the case already in some member states, uh, but not in all of them. Better align with member states uh, the external dimension of the of the foreign of the CFP with the trade policy of the European Union. For example, using the option to suspend preferential tariffs if uh, IUU yellow card is issued. We should be more aggressive with our market. In the in the SFPAs, the European Commission and the member states must ensure the non-discriminatory treatment of the European uh, fleet vis-à-vis -vis other foreign fleets. Just, uh, Mr. Lopez, uh, just yes. you're, you're talking too too quickly, so the interpreters I, cannot I uh, do their job. I'm sorry. Je m'excuse, Monsieur le Président. Uh, the credibility of the European Union in promoting its interests and standards in the world goes hand in hand with its capacity to lead by example at home, to abide by its commitment to policy coherence and for development, uh, sorry, by its commitment to policy coherence for development and rules-based uh, global order. The key challenges to achieve this are uh, achieving further consistency between the common fisheries policy and other European Union policies, including environment, trade, health, labor, and other social uh, policies, also development. Ensuring okay. the effective Mr. Lopez, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to stop you because we really have a problem of interpretation. Your sound is really too bad for the interpreters and I can understand it. It's really uh, hard to, to make that job. We are going to contact you and uh, okay. we will uh, come back to your presentation once the problem will be resolved. Okay. I'm sorry. That's Thank you. Question. Thank you. Désolé aux interprètes, j'avais pas vu votre message uh, plus tôt. Je, vais, je propose de passer so, I suggest we move on to the next speaker, just after Mr. Lopez, and we'll continue with Mr. Lopez in a bit. And now we have Daniel Buay. I might have mispronounced your name, sorry about that. He is the chair of the Black Sea Advisory Council and the president of the Danube Delta Fisheries Local Action Group. Sir, you have the floor for 10 minutes, and if you could please stick to your speaking time. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Hello to everybody. Uh, fisheries governance in the Black Sea. Black Sea Advisory Council, a framework for uh, stakeholders engagement. Next slide, please. A mission to promote a balanced representation of all stakeholders in the fisheries and the aquaculture sector and to contribute to the achievement of objectives of the common fisheries policy in the European Union. It was set up in July uh, 2015, uh, headquarters in Varna, Bulgaria, in one administrative office in Constanza, Romania. Next slide, please. A role in actions provides recommendations for the European Commission and member states regarding common fishery policy topics in the Black Sea. More than 20 recommendations provided so far on topics related to fishing stocks, landing obligation, small-scale fisheries, marine litter, etc. Next slide. Governance in the Black Sea. Challenges. Only two, Romania and Bulgaria, of the six riparian countries, are uh, European Union member states. And three, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, are GFCM members. All legally binding documents are not applied evenly and fair. New political conflict will harden all the conservation measures and will affect the health of the ecosystem by 
new forms of pollution, impossibility to transparently uh, assess stocks, distribution and abundance, impossibility to perform cross-border projects for ecosystem conservation and aquaculture development. Next slide. Uh, the particularities of the Black Sea fisheries, aquaculture and consumer profile. Only eight kilogram per capita in Romania and nine kilogram per capita in Bulgaria compared to an average of 24 kilograms per capita in European Union. Other culture is still underdeveloped, offering less alternatives and uh, to small scale fishery to grow. Infrastructure is missing in both Romania and Bulgaria. Thus, uh, application of directives, laws, measures and control is impossible or very hard. Illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing is still a great challenge, hard to quantify and stop. New wind farm projects are putting at risk fishermen and creating socioeconomic disparities in the coastal communities. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, Black Sea Advisory Council main targets. Classification of water bodies was done in Romania in 2020 with the help of uh, uh, fishing sector, uh, industry, and due to the uh, Black Sea Advisory Council recommendations, and is still pending in uh, Bulgaria. Landing ports infrastructure, a recurrent recommendation still unsolved that will provide transparency in catches, marine litter, reception facilities, and is data collection. Next slide. <clears throat> Rapana stocks, better data and trends assessment. It is an invasive species that affected muzzles and another bivalves and become the main commercial species in Romania and in Bulgaria in the past seven years. Now it is becoming commercially unattractive due to the size and lower quantities. Other stocks, tar tarbot, sprat, picked dogfish, need for common measures, better data and scientific advice, continuous consultation with the fishermen and environmental associations. Next slide. Black Sea Advisory Council needs a strong support from the member states' authorities in innovation, research and developing new business opportunities. Involvement in marine spatial planning process, protected area definition and management plans, and wind farms developing. Consultation in aspects related to fishing gear, disposal and selectivity. Fishing for litter projects and banning periods of and uh, or areas. Thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you. Merci, cher monsieur, pour uh, votre intervention. Est-ce qu'on a résolu? Thank you, dear sir, for your the presentation. Have we solved the technical issue that we had from the previous presentation? So, well. Allow me to give the floor to Mr. Nins Beklund, representative of the NGO Coalition for a Clean Baltic, who's also president of the Working Group on Management based on Ecosystems in the Advisory Framework for the Baltic Sea. You have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, can you hear and see me okay? Yes, please. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, happy thank, uh, St. Patrick's Day, and I honor that by wearing my Ukrainian Vishivanka shirt. And in the words of Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. 
Yes, I would like to offer you uh, uh, my perspective or our perspective a little bit on on uh, this discussion. And I have to say it's been very interesting listening to a lot of these angles. Uh, and I am uh, going to address some of them, I guess, again in my um, uh, intervention here. This is a satellite image of the beautiful Baltic Sea from a, perhaps a different angle than you're used to. This is taken somewhere over Lithuania. You see Sweden there and Denmark way in the backdrop there. It's a slightly different angle and different reality. And that's also what I would like to sort of frame this little intervention with. Um, there is clearly a tendency uh, and an urge to, to sort of change the rules uh, as a fix to, to problems that we have. Uh, we can change the rules every two three years, but it won't matter if the regulation itself is not the problem to begin with. And down there in the water that you see of this beautiful satellite image, there is a very, very harsh reality of a degraded ecosystems and completely collapsed fish stocks. Actually, some of the situations that you guys have been talking about already in the interventions prior, me, prior to me about what we're seeing a, a, as a possible development, etc., that's already happened in the Baltic. The fish stocks that were iconic, huge stocks fished for, for, for hundreds of years are gone. The cod is gone. So we're already sort of at that point. But the key question for us today and the discussions we're having is, are the rules of the CFP to fault for this reality or not? And just to not keep you on the ropes here, Chair, I will answer that right away. And I will say, no, the legal framework is in place. Uh, and, and that's not the problem, the main problems of today. And I will try to, to focus instead on some of those problems that we think we have. These problems arise from outside the CFP. It's lack of political determination. It's due to conflict of interest or, or simply poor implementation. And we've already heard some of the interventions prior to, to, to me here today on, on some of these, these uh, reports and you know, official sources. But I will, I will repeat them nonetheless. I mean, we've had... SDCF, for example, noted in 2019 that the stocks in the Mediterranean, for example, are, are some of them are fished twice the sustainable level. I mean, that's not that is not an uh, that is not a, a CFP problem or a choke species situation. That's unacceptable. We have the EU Court of Auditors noting that's already been said today in 2020 that the tools for marine protection or reaching MSY, a regionalized approach, is there, but it's not implemented. It's not used. And chair, just a uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, I listened to the European Fishery Control Agency and uh, in, in presenting their uh, compliance report with the landing obligation for the Baltic Sea. And it's, it's rather disturbing, actually, where we're seeing more or less no change in the discard rates of the cod in place, for example. Well, now the cod fishery is closed, like I said, but still prior to that. So in short, we seem to very clearly have a massive implementation deficit here. It's on MSY, it's landing obligation, it's shifting to an ecosystem-based marine you know, management. And we just feel it's important to underline there's no room for wishful thinking here or, or looking for simple solutions. We really need to fix what's wrong and, and start being honest. So the next slide, please. So what's really wrong here then? Well, here's, here comes my sort of alternative perspectives to bring in a, a, another part of this into the discussion. We have basically designed our marine system or marine management system here shown as a car with dual controls from the EU top level to down, you know, to national level. Our seeds are suffering because we have these very unclear mandates of who's actually driving this car. We have clear goals. We have a place to reach with a car. And, and these goals, by the way, are shared, say, for example, by CFP and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, but the car hardly moves or strangely at least. But not only that, the car has dual controls, two drivers, but and, and this confused understanding who's actually steering, but there's also a wall between the two drivers, making it impossible for them to actually discuss and, and you know have an idea of how we should steer this, sh or this, this car. Fishery is managed in a silo, and it's not on equal terms with the relevant environmental legislations, although obviously in the real world, they're inseparable. Now, if we don't sort this out, again, we will have the Baltic situation elsewhere. The stocks that are gone, herring stocks and cod stocks set at zero uh, quotas, basically. We have to give the managers a chance to slow down and turn this car around. And the tools for that are here. But again, if you suggest that the CFP is really the problem, I think you're mistaken. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so 
Not only that, but there's obviously, and this again has been said a few times, I think, but it's, but it's just a reality that we just have to face. There is a conflict between economic and environmental interest, although it's a conflict that in a sense doesn't exist because it's 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 uh, you know it's not even real because without economy i mean there is no economy with a crashed ecosystem that's my point but again this is not a cfp problem these are noted all over in all kinds of official uh, uh, progress reports of all kinds of eu legislation and this conflict if we don't resolve it and don't find a way forward we will simply not get anywhere this this doesn't matter we can change the regulations forever and it won't matter in a way, and needs needs to be underlined, ecosystem-based management is actually designed to resolve, you know, this several user interests at once, while keeping the ecosystem health front and center. That's what it's made for. And again, fail to actually do this and implement this. The Baltic Sea is your example. So, what do we do then? <laughs> Next slide, please. I said. Uh, there is a tendency to, to go for changing the rules as a solution to fix simple or seek for simple solutions. But I don't think the CFP rules are the key problem. Actually, the, we have already heard some big speakers say that supporting and, and other legislations around the CFP or other instruments that are incoming can be used to fix these problems. What we need to do is to roll up our sleeves. So, and here's my instruction for that. Number one, I think, again, focus back on the real problems and implementation gaps uh, and spend all time and resource here. There are many ways to handle and if, if you like, plug the gaps, uh, Espen has been saying, you know, patchwork, well, let's make it, make it less patchy and make it clearer. But by opening or changing the CFP, I'm not, you know, convinced that we're actually doing that. And most of the points I've heard today, I seem to not really feel that the CFP is still the main problem. Second point, Chair, is maximizing the use of all the rules and incoming initiatives, as I said already. There is a lot on the plate and there's more coming that should be used in light of point number one. Make sure those are implementing, uh, pushing implementing gaps. Third, and this is back to my car, we need to clarify these mandates and break up these dual controls, this silo that fishing management sit in, basically, and give clear guidance and mandate from the top, from the EU level commission and down to help these drivers of the car work together. And four, and I think this one has been also mentioned, I think we badly need a more complete science approach to help the managers here to reach this ecosystem-based management. We can't continue with a single species focus. They really need more options and understanding of uh, different effects of setting quotas or technical measures, and they are not really there. And mind you, I'm not necessarily blaming anyone here. I'm saying this is a huge challenge we need to work on. We need to be impatient with the lack of progress, but we need to keep working. So, Chairs, those were the points I wanted to bring to the conversation. I don't know about you, but uh, you know I, we're certainly ready to roll up our sleeves uh, and, uh, and and continue working on this. And thank you again for inviting me and giving me the floor. Thank you. Merci, cher Monsieur. Thank you, sir. Well, now I'd like to give the floor to Alicia Vidoris Iglesias, who's Secretary General of Fisheries at the Spanish Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. Mrs. Vidoris, go ahead. Buenos días a todos. Good morning to all. There's a terrible background noise. I'm very grateful to be able to have the opportunity to attend this public hearing, which is taking place Madam, there's terrible background noise. The interpreter is sorry, but it's very hard to hear you. We will be calling you by phone to see if we can iron out this problem. So the chairman goes back to Mr. Lopez, who will be able to make the part of the presentation that he wasn't able to do before. Go ahead. Merci. Uh, I will both try to speak slower and also reduce the time, as I see uh, we are a little bit lost, uh, I mean, uh, behind the agenda. Uh, I was, 
I'm going to focus then on what is needed forward. And as I said uh, before, in case it was not translated, I am focusing mainly on the external dimension of the European Union, uh, of the Common Fisheries Policy, as it was a part that was left, uh, so say, incipient in the original uh, form, as it was the first time that it was included and now needs, I think, an evolution. Uh, and that is the opinion of the Long Distance uh, Advisory Council as well. That's the one I'm, I'm representing. So, as I said, uh, main goals that you need uh, for moving forward is to achieve uh, further consistency between the CFP and other European Union policy, including um, uh, environment, trade, health, labour and other social uh, policies. Ensure the effective and harmonised implementation of the CFP and of the relevant related instruments, such as uh, control, uh, IU, IUU, SMEF, etc., uh, and to have the adequate human resources to do this. It will be very important to foster greater transparency in the, value, in the fisheries value chain, ensuring reliable and comprehensive fisheries data collection from fleets in terms of reporting and good data processing. This is very important uh, so that we can know what is happening and, uh, and that uh, there is less doubts about what is happening. Sorry about that. Um, enhanced, to enhance the policy coherence for development and use uh, as a reference for framework when dealing with aspects related to international fisheries, to promote a culture of compliance and ensuring a level playing field between the European Union and non-European Union fishing vessels. Uh, this requires a reinforced traceability. To identify both good and bad practices and to quantify the value of uh, European Union private investments in third countries uh, and have uh, and value its role in transferring know-how, technology, training, skills and the creation of local employment and fixing population. Also, uh, the way of fishing and standards are transferred through, through this investment set. To ensure that the union fishing activities outside the European Union waters are based on the same principles and standards as those applicable under the European Union law, in particular by providing incentives to those operators who fish more sustainable. If you can to, to speak a little bit more slowly, please. Yes. And provide the greatest benefits for local economies, and that uh, the CFP shall be guided by coherence between the internal and the external dimension as a principle of good governance. Finally, we need to update and focus the feasible traceability procedures of all seafood products. This is very important these days, and uh, actually, uh, to have a, a fully traceability will ensure only not only that we know where fish comes from, but also that the cheats like uh, the change of origin by processing in third countries uh, is avoided. This is especially relevant these days and more in the wake of the Russian production of fish and, and the Ukrainian aggression. Uh, Norway processes more than 70,000 tons of fish and then it comes in uh, of, of Russian origin, for instance, and then it comes into the European Union uh, as um, a Norwegian fish. So, uh, the, through the revised control regulation, also member states should use the European Union electronic databases from catch certificates and not just the paperwork to prevent illegal fisheries products from entering the EU market. Uh, there are some gaps here. And propose additional legislation to tackle the use of flag of convenience uh, by EU national uh, companies, if the case, and the abusive flagging, which happens in some cases. In a particular level, I think what we need, the EU needs to focus is on the level playing field and market access. Uh, it's very important uh, how these interact, and the market access will is the only teeth that the EU has left to really keep its relevance in the international arena. We are the most desired food market for fish products, and therefore we have not to have a fear to use this market to condition how the fish is extracted and, and exploited in other areas. For this, like we said, uh, it's important to have very good traceability figures uh, to, to, to be able to identify uh, the vessel itself so that we can move to a uh, market access system that targets not nations itself, like uh, with an on and off area, but you could even target operators and exclude those non-compliant laggard operators. And on the contrary, as said before, we can reward the champions. This will be uh, one of the key developments uh, forward for the European Union. Um, 
Also, the market is very important in keeping up with the environmental uh, bars that the European Union sets. Uh, that is, if we want uh, all the products in the European Union to be caught environmental, uh, so sustainable and socially sustainable, we have to exclude those that are not. And this is very important because it's not the case now. And uh, for that, basically, what we need is to move from a regulation of the producer, which is what happens in the European Union now, to a, regu a regulation of the product sold in the European Union. Uh, the CFP focused only in the producers based in the European Union and tells us how to fish, but it does not do the same for those products fished outside of the European Union and then sold here. So there is a little bit of a misguiding to the consumer when this is done. Uh, the investments in third countries are also very important. They are a growing area, and I think we should aim at having the best practices in the world and have our, uh, make sure that every citizen of the European Union and every company of the European Union investing in third countries has the best and highest level, never lower than the CFP. In any case, I would like to say that soon we will announce uh, from the Long Distance AC uh, a seminar precisely on this matter with uh, high involvement, uh, high level involvement of uh, countries from Africa, and etc., uh, where we aim to do precisely this, event, identify the best practices. The commitment to ocean governance, international governance, Can you come cannot to your be, conclusion, yes, Mr. Lopes? It's, it's very important. Uh, for this, the bet on RFMOs, as FPAs, as this, the, the tools, will be very important. And, of course, the BBNJ process. But I'd just like to finish with one thing. There has been talk about regionalization. This will be very important at member state levels. It should be – policy should be uh, more done around groups with uh, – made up of legitimate interest uh, parties. The ACs are a good example. We would like to have more uh, involvement with the European Union. And I'd like to make just a final comment, Chair. Uh, just uh, sorry uh, to, to Barton and uh, sorry for this very strange presentation that happened today. But the, this is that the Commission has a big thing on its plate. Uh, it is the Commons Fisheries Policy. It's the true, one truly European level policy. Yet the resources at disposal are dwindling every time reducing every time we have less human resources to deal with this. And this is a real problem of legitimacy. I will finish with this, and especially at international level. If we want to lead the world uh, of fisheries, you need to have the right people in the right places, and you cannot have exhausted staff that is not able to follow all the meetings, even in times of coronavirus. Again, I'd just like to apologize for the very confusing uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I don't know what happened with the sound, uh, but I still want to reiterate the thank you for inviting us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Je passe uh, donc la parole à Madame. I'll now give the floor to uh, Mrs. Iglesias from the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food in Spain. Muchas gracias de nuevo. Thank you very much. Once again, here with you, I'm very grateful to the European Parliament for giving me the opportunity to attend this public hearing, which is taking place at such an important moment for two reasons. First, because after 10 years since the most recent reform of the CFP, it is now time to accelerate our thoughts on drawing conclusions, its outcomes, and discuss the needs for setting new objectives. And the second reason is the events that we've experienced over the last two years with an unprecedented pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine with very serious consequences, including economic conferences, cause us to accelerate this process of thought as to how we can ensure supplies for the European Union in sectors which are as strategic as food. And we must not forget fishing and aquaculture. Now, the uh, CFP in 2013 was very ambitious, it was very wide in scope, and it introduced very advanced ideas about environmental issues. The environment is an essential pillar of sustainability, and we need to have healthy and productive oceans so that we can ensure the conservation of the marine environment. But at the same time, it's crucial to pay a special attention to ensure the compatibility of that pillar with social and economic 
aspect of fishing activity and the territory on which this activity takes place. And I would like to point out that I think it is essential when it comes to defining tomorrow's CFP. We need to take into account the sensitivity and experience of the fisheries sector. This is the only way that we can attain our objectives that we set before us. And we would have an ambitious fisheries policy, which is also realistic, because ultimately fishing is an economic activity and it can only be truly sustainable if it attains profitability levels, which are sufficient to be sustainable over time. And this is why national and EU administrations need to work hard to provide a regulatory framework and the tools that uh, encourage modernization and professionalization of the sector. And the sector at the same time needs to be fully focused focused on imp improving its business approach and enhance added value in the fisheries sector. The aim of having better scientific information must serve as a basis for management of the CFP in the future, but at the same time, it needs to evolve. Putting um, the best data, the best studies through a ecosystemic based approach, scientific approach, which looks at interactions between various stocks and the specificities of each fishery, um, environmental actors on aspects uh, such as climate change, which are not connected to fishing practices, and also new economic activities that share the same space. Experience tells us that a partial implementation of this principle causes clear distortions when it comes to the outcomes achieved. There's also a need to focus on streamlining the CFP, which must have a <clears throat> must serve as a guideline for future action based on knowledge from the field and the reality of fisheries, which many cases are different from one another <clears throat> in different basins, for example. But we always need to ensure equality of treatment, which is an essential principle of the European Union. Another of the most important um, measures introduced in such a reform was landing uh, requirements. And we need to assess its usefulness because I think we can all agree that its implementation was a major challenge and it required significant efforts both by the fishing sectors as well as administrations. We can take note of the lessons learned in designing the future's fisheries policy and we've introduced improvements to ensure that improvements are proportionate and realistic and are adapted and tailored to the reality of different fishery environments. And when it comes to policies that govern fishing activity, we need to have clear assessment, a detailed assessment of what the situation so we know what the point of departure is. And it's crucial that we have a systematic assessment throughout the implementation of the policy so that we can determine um, how it's working and, if necessary, take steps to improve it. And as this is something that we have been putting forward, and it's unfortunate that it was not heard at the last um, minister, f fisheries minister's meeting, because instead of looking at fishing efforts, we should have looked at the measures that were implemented for over the last two years. We welcome advances made in achieving max maximum sustainable yields. But we need to be very careful about abrupt reductions of efforts in fishing sectors in very short spans of time. This can lead to undesirable side effects, especially people moving away from fishing. And one aspect that we need to include is the social pillar. It's essential to ensure that fishing activity can continue in future generations. We need to invest in improving the safety and livability on f fishing vessels and also reduce their energy consumption so that we can reduce dependence on fossil fuels. We cannot afford to be losing vessels and jobs in the fishing sector year on year. So we need to make sure that communities remain dynamic. These are coastal regions which are dependent on fishing. So there are many factors which influence on this sector, but I think it is important to point out that the 21st century fishing needs 21st century boats, and this is not what we are experiencing right now. And therefore, now is the time to put on the table the discussion on how we're going to finance the renewal of the community fleet such that we can rely on safe, modern, and efficient vessels without 
uh, increasing the fishing effort because we need to point out that we also have management tools, tools for monitoring and control of the fishing activity that are appropriate to the 21st century. It's also important to give a great deal of thought on how to manage this. And we feel that management of fishing capability over time in the fleets of member states is making it more difficult to moder modernize our vessels. And so the fleet is older and older, and it's very difficult to update its energy efficiency or even improve its safety. And at the time that we are today, in which international fishing is increasingly uh, preponderant, we need to have an EU approach to the sector and we need to strengthen and improve our sustainability criteria for other fleets worldwide whose activities are also dependent on the overall c condition of our oceans and seas. That said, it's important to work on being the best and at the same time to ensure the compliance with the so-called level playing field. and foster fairer rules of the game and rules that don't just have to do with environmental sustainability, but also rules that have to do with working conditions and respect for human rights. Similarly, the future common fisheries policy should continue redoubling its efforts in order to take advantage of a sustainable fishing model through um, fisheries agreements with third countries and the EU's participation in regional fishery organizations. These organizations are the most auspicious forum to make that connection between science and policy, where we have govern governments, industry, and science that meet together in a regional context which is adjusted to each basin and its resources. There are many other issues that we need to give thought to when it comes to thinking about what type of community fishing policy we want for the future. <clears throat> but I would just like to conclude to save time. We need sustainable and profitable fisheries, which ensure food security at the community level. It needs to continue to be a part of the construction of European coastal regions, which generate employment and wealth, and that promote culture and tradition. They can coexist with other activities that are developed in the same area, and we need to take a leadership role in the transition of fisheries governance at the worldwide level towards a, an, a model which is more global, more responsible, more efficient. Building this common fisheries policies is an exercise which requires all of our efforts, and so I'm very pleased to see this hearing that the European Parliament has put together, which will contrib contribute to having us move in the right direction in our process of thought. Thank you. Merci, chère madame. Je maintenant uh, ouvrir. Uh... Thank you very much indeed. I'll now open the floor to colleagues. Uh, if you're online, then please hit the raise the hand button so that we have an idea of how many people would like to take the floor. Here in the room, who would like to take the floor? You, Gabriel, uh, Nicola, a couple of others. Okay, so four or five from the room. Just give us a cup. Uh, I'll give you three minutes each so that we have some time at the end to hear the answers from the speakers. Let's start with Gabriel. Chair, if you agree, I have some time for conclusions in the end. So perhaps I'll only speak after everyone has taken the floor. Uh, yes, fair point, Gabriel. Mr. González Casares. Bueno, hemos visto como... Well, we've seen how the common fisheries policy is something that uh, provides the highest level of compliance with rules and this is sometimes something that pushes us towards changes that can be difficult but necessary. Now, finding this balance between sustainability, economic profitability is a complex one. We've seen in the recent past how there have been imbalances and uh, we are feeling the effects. We are seeing how the fishery sector is suffering all across Europe. Ms. Alicia, we are, uh, talked about how we need 
to keep into uh, we have to take into account that when we are implementing measures that we are definitely going in the uh, right direction. We are facing major challenges. Sometimes people are also skeptical from within the sector or they simply don't understand how we wish to achieve more sustainable, more efficient fisheries without allowing vessels to receive aid to exactly become that more efficient and more sustainable. We can sometimes be more efficient by increasing capacity. And now there is one urgent need for uh, fisheries vessels in the European Union. We can see that uh, the cost of uh, fuel is incredibly high and if we don't give them any alternatives, if we don't actually push and foster these alternatives, then it's going to continue to eat into the earnings of our fisher, fishing communities and some of them will just have to give up. So we need to strike a balance. Europe is uh, at the vanguard of sustainable fisheries in the world. We are the leaders when it comes to standards, when it comes to protection and upholding of these standards. But at the same time, we also have to talk about a social balance. We also have to remember that fish is a food. It's a sustainable, healthy food. And it needs to be possible to put food on all tables across the continent in a, at a price that is affordable and we have to ensure that uh, the fish that actually reaches the tables of European consumers, it does so in a sustainable way upholding all different standards. It is only in this way that we will protect uh, uh, European fisheries uh, comprehensively. So. Any step forward has to take into account this impact assessment that was mentioned. And this uh, impact assessment cannot just focus on one of the pillars, but in fact, it is something that has to take into balance the different different kinds of balances that we have to uh, strike. Thank you very much. I'll now give the floor to Mr. Ilcic. Hvala predsjedavajući. Zanimljivo je bilo danas. Thank you, Chair. It was the debate was very interesting today. I think these hearings are very important for us because we can um, talk and uh, make decisions on the political level. But if we don't uh, talk to the science and uh, the people working uh, in the field, we cannot uh, achieve progress. Uh, we hear. Uh, dramatic appeals of fishermen who say that uh, the situation is not sustainable. The same uh, we hear from uh, the scientific community. And it's actually similar to what uh, Mr. Hoglund showed with uh, to, uh, uh, his, his automobile um, metaphor. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, task at hand is not purely mathematical. We cannot uh, just simply add up the numbers and come uh, up with a solution. And I believe that no approach, uh, either the one uh, working only for fishermen or the other working only for uh, uh, environmentalists, is not a good approach. So no single approach it will be good. We need to find good balance, taking everything into account. We cannot keep saying that uh, the envi environmental aspects are the only important aspects, because if uh, there will be no fish, we will have no fishermen. But we do need to uh, take into account the social aspect, uh, because uh, if we endanger the working conditions and uh, the livelihoods of fishermen, we will have no fisheries. We want to secure as uh, much uh, safe and healthy food for the citizens of the EU. And another thing in the end, please, uh, there are some uh, common points, I'm sure such as uh, the fight against pollution. I would be very strict on this. Uh, also, there's the common market that is important for everyone, all the parties involved. Uh, uh, we can limit uh, the uh, profit margins uh, of uh, second-hand buyers, but uh, we need to keep uh, trying to achieve balance to achieve maximum results. Thank you. 
Merci, chers collègues. Je passe la parole. Thank you, dear colleague. I'll give the floor now to Carmen Avram. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I'm sorry, Chair. I'm, I'm just juggling between two committees right now. Um, uh, regarding our um, speakers today, I'm just glad to see that three out of them uh, are representing advisory councils. Uh, in my view, only through advisory councils, the stakeholders can, can have a decisive influence on the course of, of policymaking and implementation of the common fisheries policies. I want to ask the representatives of the advisory councils present if their recommendations were taken on board and if they were clearly reflected in the Commission's proposals since the establishment of the Councils, what are the challenges uh, they faced in the last two years and how did they manage to tackle the problems of the sector in the COVID period? Uh, for Mr. Buhai, uh, an additional question, how is the fishing sector in the Black Sea dealing with the shortcomings derived from the Ukrainian war? Uh, did the Black Sea Advisory Council made any uh, recommendations? Uh, for Mrs. Um, Iglesias, uh, one question, recreational fishing is included in the common fisheries policy through the control regulations and the quota regulations, but uh, the common fisheries policy does not specifically mention recreational fishing, only focusing on the conservation of marine biological resources and the management of fisheries. How do you evaluate the possibility of full inclusion of the recreational fisheries in the CFP? And how do you see the role of the recreational fisheries in the achievement of the CFP and Green Deal objectives? Thank you. Merci, Madame Abraham. Je... Thank you, Mrs. Avram. We've uh, heard from the colleagues now, so I'll turn the floor over to our speakers, our panelists, in the order that we took them in earlier. You have three minutes each, uh, so Mr. Lopez, I'll give you the floor first. Merci, Mr. le Président. Uh, uh, in order to comply with the three minutes, I am going to focus on one of the questions that was just asked by Ms. Abram uh, about the EACs. Uh, actually, it's a question I welcome very much and I think is very relevant uh, for, for this. Uh, the EACs are very important and, and they work very hard pro bono to, to come together, NGOs and industry, as a general rule of thumb, uh, to, to, to to bring common opinions uh, based on unanimity. That is a big effort, but, and, and it's a good objective. But the EU, the Commission, is not using the full power the ACs has. Uh, lately, there is less participation in the ACs. They say it's because they lack personnel. There is supposed to have more inter-AC meetings, which is where we have one meeting with all the ACs at the same time, obviously losing a lot of depth of analysis. And uh, they get irate if we collaborate, with, for instance, with the European Parliament. That those are our problems. And, but the biggest problem is the consultation process. And now we have been put at the same level as the citizens. Uh, and many times they say, please, uh, give your advice through the online consultation. That makes no sense. We are a part of the CFP. We want to be a useful tool. We spend a lot of money. By the way, thank you to the government of Spain for backing uh, the long distance AC since its beginning 15 years ago. And a, a, a clearer role should be there for the ACs. But more importantly, the, the Commission has to make up its mind on how to want to use it and not say every time, you guys do whatever you do, and then we will see what you, what you come back. This is very sad, and, and, and we need to have a clearer uh, objective. And finally, what would be very welcome is that the Commission tells us if our advice has been useful, what it has been useful for, and how it is reflected in legislation, because it's impossible to track. We have no idea uh, when we do these advices who would read them. That is why we all end up posting them online on our web pages and sending it to everybody, hoping that the Parliament will pick them up and use them uh, in their questions to the Parliament. So I think the ACs are a very good example of why some reform is needed in the CFP and uh, a clear idea of what to do with a good idea is also needed on the part of the Commission. And I think that is more than enough for three minutes. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I hand over to Mr. Buhai. Three minutes, please. Well, okay. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you for your for your question, uh, Mrs. Avram. Um, uh, how is the fishing sector in the Black Sea dealing with the shortcomings derived from the Ukrainian war? Um, we uh, were expecting to a recovery for the fishing sector after the pandemic, but the war in Ukraine is setting a very unclear and unpredictable climate in terms of evolution of fishing permit catches and stocks. The war, along with the political and humanitarian crisis, is also an environmental threat that is posing our resources in danger. Resources that for some of us represent their only income. The maritime national border of Romania is at approximately 10 kilometers away from the Snake Island, island which is presently occupied by the Russian Navy. And this fact is creating big problems for the Romanian fishermen in that area, that they have uh, the best catches of turbot. Half of national quota is done there. Evidently, uh, it is uh, discouraging and dangerous to fish nearby. Clearly, the fish and seafood market is dramatically, dramatically affected in the last period because of this conflict. The fuel cost almost double, and as you know, the fuel is the main component in the fish and seafood price. Thank you very much. Merci, cher Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for this first-hand account and we would like to express our solidarity to you for the fisher immense that are directly affected uh, by the fact that uh, the german uh, sorry the russian navy is uh, there in the same waters as them you are clearly dealing with uh, this uh, issue firsthand so thank you very much for uh, those remarks and now i hand over to mr huglund for 3 minutes Ah, there we are, waiting for the thing to turn red. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, difficult, uh, a lot of difficult uh, issues and discussions going on. And, and I'll come back to, to my, uh, you know, initial uh, reaction here when I started speaking before that the, the key question really is, are these problems best served by opening the CFP or, or looking at these things specifically? Or are we rather much better uh, served by spending all our resources and efforts at actually making that like, work and using what we have in front of us. Obviously, I'm in favor of, of, of the latter. And I just want to say one thing, because I felt there was a reflection or, or a hint of a reflection there uh, of one of the members about this conflict between fisheries and, and NGOs. And I, I really have an issue with that, because I know a lot of fishermen there are even, well, I would have to say they're more radical than I am when it comes to demands on, on, on protecting the environment and, 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 and saving the, the ecosystems. I also know NGO people, myself included, that want nothing more than an actual fishing sector. I want to buy fishing, I mean, fish products from my local fisherman. He is gone. Most of the fishermen in the co coastal area of the Baltic, they are gone because we have mismanaged and not taken the opportunities at hand. So instead of spending energy and time of, of looking to fix, like I said, as something simple in a paragraph, which is nonsense, the fishermen I know would urge us to get to work, fix the problems that we have here and now. They can be handled. The rules are in place. The member states and the commission can act jointly to solve this. That's where I am. And, and please, really, we have to get away from this fight between NGOs and fishermen. That is not the reality I live in, certainly not in our advisory councils, where we can sometimes clearly agree. Uh, there is no such fight in reality. The fishermen know full well that the ecosystem is what we need to provide for their reality and their livelihoods. Thank you, Chair. Merci, cher monsieur. Thank you very much. Mr. Villaris, uh, you also have three minutes, please.
Sí, se me escucha ahora. Can you hear me? Okay. Firstly, I would like to uh, thank you for the comments that have been provided, as well as the question that was di addressed directly to me with respect to recreational fishing. I think this is a very important sector. It's a sector that has also grown exponentially in recent years in Spain, a country that is especially uh, propitious to tourism. We receive uh, millions of tourists throughout the year, and uh, recreative fishing is uh, closely linked with tourism. We think it's very important, firstly, to get an idea of the scope of this activity and then to regulate it. The CFP, I think, already touches on this point in the sense that uh, you do carry out some controls uh, through the control regulation, and in this way, a recreational fishing is um, uh, subject to some checks. Furthermore, we need systematic data reporting on recreational fish fishing as well. Just like we have it for the professional sector, we need to have it for the recreational sector as well. In Spain, we are making a specific effort to come up with legislation here. We're talking about a new legislation on sustainable fisheries that's in the pipeline. And furthermore, all the other standards that have to be do with the knowledge about the scope of a certain activity, uh, setting up standards for management, as well as talking about uh, controls where it comes to the fact that fish stocks are a public good and this affects everyone. We're also trying to determine the different types of recreational fishing that exist. You have superficial from land, uh, marine, uh, deep sea recreational fishing, etc. So we are trying to actually determine these parameters so that we can have more direct, in-depth, comprehensive data on this activity. And thus we can ensure the recreational fishing also complies with the necessary legislation and they also work towards sustainability. Just one quick comment on what was said with respect to the important work that is being done by the advisory councils and there I agree with them. I think the best way to get a more detailed uh, picture that is closer to reality and something that we directly support in Spain as well in all our advisory councils that we participate in, we think that another key element to better understand the different fishing zones and to be able to export uh, sustainable fishing models that we have been talking about, we need a common fisheries policy that l works on sustainability parameters. And it's very important that through international governance, this model can be exported to other parts of the world. You have international waters where there's no regulation that is so detailed and so specific. And I think this is the part ahead. This is the work that we need to do uh, in the future of the CFP. And I think all of us need to commit to this so that we can have better fisheries governance at an international scale. This is absolutely key. And this is one of the objectives that I think we can work on much more within the CFP. And I hope that in the coming years, we will make significant progress on this front. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to all the speakers and to everyone who has uh, participated in this meeting. We've gotten a very comprehensive picture. And now I'll hand over to Gabriel Mato, who's a rapporteur for the report on the implementation of the CFP. So, of course, a very important part of our debate. And I think he will be able to draw on some conclusions for this hearing. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, everyone. First, I would like to start off by thanking all the speakers as well as the MEPs who took the floor. I think such events are very useful because it really complements something that we've already done, this survey that we sent out and we hope that we will receive all the data and comments by the end of this month. And it's highly possible that we will have some more hearings as well. I am uh, nonetheless looking forward to this document that we will draw up. Now in this document, we're looking at the future. Where do we go from here? Now, frankly speaking, I'm quite skeptical about whether we can talk about implementation with a, without reforms. I think 
it's very difficult if not impossible to implement something that is difficult or almost impossible in and of itself so i think there's a lot of work to be done still it's become clear that the cfp has some shortcomings it does not uh, substantially take into account climate change Furthermore, in my opinion, I think it also doesn't take uh, into account the socio-economic aspects sufficiently. That's something that's come out today as well. We need better management tools for conservation. And here, I think we need to uh, make an effort. Now, the objective of the CFP cannot simply be more resources, like more abundant fisheries resources, so to speak, or a lower impact. In fact, it needs to ensure that we have a highest degree of sustainable product production that ensures food security, but at the same time also provides economic and social benefits to the sector as well as coastal communities. This is what we need to work on. It's quite true that today we've talked about uh, how we need uh, vessels that are fit for purpose but well we need to invest in them this is something that i touched on in my report as well where then uh, the multi-annual uh, financial framework and when we talk about maritime funding as well we also have to talk about the social um, situation in the sector and furthermore we cannot talk about better energy efficiency if we don't have a better kitchen at home or a better bathroom and therefore we have to talk about this for fisher uh, folk as well that they need better vessels i think this has been very important and then the last bit of the discussion was on governance i think here there's two two aspects firstly we need to ensure that we are able to have good governance within the european union and then secondly how the european union can actually promote its interests and its sustainability model to then ensure sustainable fisheries at an international scale that benefits all. Unfortunately, I have to admit that in recent years, uh, fisheries uh, is, are losing uh, importance within the European Commission. Fisheries is a strategic sector and therefore we need to see how we can ensure that we do uh, get the importance that we deserve within the European uh, Commission. Furthermore, within governance, we also have to talk about the advisory councils. I think the advisory councils are absolutely key. They are very important, not just for the commission and the council, but for the parliament as well. We need to have a clear idea of where we want to place these councils within the decision-making process or how exactly we can emancipate them so that they can play this key role that they anyway have. Furthermore, what sort of powers do we want to give them? I think the COVID-19 pandemic has been a hard blow to the fisheries sector, but to the advisory councils as well. Uh, another aspect is uh, uh, offshore wind farms and many other policies. And all of these, I think, do not actually lead to a sigh of relief within the fishery sector, quite the contrary. So I think that we really need to think about this. Uh, the opportunities for fisheries are being curtailed uh, all the time where we might have a smaller sector, but it needs to be a strategic sector to ensure socioeconomic uh, conditions and environmental conditions are necessary for fisheries. We need to ensure that fisheries and aquaculture have the place they deserve as compared to other sectors when we're drawing up uh, policy, and this is where we need to intervene. Thank you very much for your contributions, and I'm totally convinced that at the end of this long process, we will have a good document that will actually live up to the expectations of everyone all around. Thank you. Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you for those concluding remarks. I would just like to let you know that the next committee meeting will be held on Monday, the 25th of April in the afternoon as of 3 p.m. So I look forward to seeing you there in time. Thank you very much to uh, all my colleagues who have helped me this week. Thank you to the Secretariat uh, for the PESH Committee. Thank you very much for all the work you've done. Thank you to the interpreters, says the speaker kindly. <laughs> kindly. Working conditions were not ideal today. 
but uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to understand our speakers anyway and wishing you all a great day goodbye